Hello, hello, Danger Noodles. Uh, I am alone. Ignore this person over here who is better at the game than me. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... Okay, it's literally just because I've played it before, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, one of the things I found out about Busta. Um, he by far is the best big brother dog there is he will literally i literally saw him he almost tempted to fight two dobermans while the pupper was behind him he was baring his fangs and everything with his tail tucked down which is a sign of saying i get close and i'm gonna bite you mm. he is a brave dog -o. an ultimate big brother and uh, i'm proud of him but i also don't want him fighting the dobermans mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah there was also one thing uh, i couldn't pet sit with uh buddy because there's a, one of the marines dogs that comes over buddy because buddy does not like the pupper at all and uh busta ripped him a new one <laughs> <laughs> Because, <laughs> like, Buddy tried to steal the do the food of the dog. And Buster literally dragged him away and buried his fangs at him. Buster was having none of it. One second, I should make him back. So, yeah. So, yeah. Buster's a good boy. As you can tell, Buster's a good boy. Oh, hold on. I'm not getting a phone call. Be right back. Puppy needs attention for uh food mainly, so be back.
Pocket back right. All right, I'm back. Uh, and I need a refill on water and food. Welcome back. Thank you. All right, now let's go kill people. Hey, what? I said now let's go kill people. That's what we do in the game. <laughs> okay. Um... You know what I kind of think about it? I wonder if my internet was causing the issue for Dead Space to load on OBS. If that's the case, if that was the issue, that means I can stream the new Dead Space game. And that would be amazing if, if that's the truth. I would love that. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. I guess I can test that out, uh, maybe... Another time. Oh, it's me, I'm first. The old phase and the new. I will use both to guide us. Follow me. I will cut a path to perfection. Charged and ready. We don't have any support this time. Well, we have we do have a defense member, so that's really good. Uh, Come find me. Now we're playing with the big leagues. Oh, B man is jump master. No, 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 we aren't. Oh, now you're jump master. <laughs> As you can tell, I do like this landing spot over here. Yeah. <laughs> Are we gonna make it? Yeah, we should be able to. As long as I find a way... Yeah, we should be able to. We'll just have to, like, get... Once we get here, run off as quickly as possible. There we go. Is not close. So where's that? There's something there. That's an SMG. I'll just take this for now. I'm look for a shotgun. This is a no, this is a sniper rifle. Okay, so here's a sniper. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go with this one. Um, that's a good sniper. Okay. And, uh, um, so there's there's a marksman over here. But I don't think you want to use one of those. Oh. 
I mean, I do have a weapon. Shotgun bolt here. New kill Level three. Appointed. By, by the way, Bright, you can climb up stuff. Yeah, I found out. Let's get some more ammo. Attention. The champion has been... Keep finding SMGs. <gasps> Finally! Time to find you. The ring is coming. Reposition. Now. Man, Brad, there's stuff up here where our... Wait, why are they putting up stuff? Uh, okay. I think I'll let you grab that one. We have an Evo tower here. Right. Extended heavy mag here. Uh, Evo Level shield. Door. Oh, Evo shield. Where? Oh, they had uh, pinged it. Here, uh, I'll go grab it. I'll show you. It's right there. Location interests me. Yeah. Disregard that. Extended heavy mag here. Level three. Oh wait. I'll. Oh, there's a second one. Grab that mag and hey, I'll grab that. Adurner, there's a second one right here. Evil shield. Okay, I'll grab it. One sec. Evil shield here. Level two. Boom, boom. Oh yeah, I'm bright. If you haven't gotten uh. An excellent selection. Fuck. Yeah, I got a shotgun. Oh, you found another evil shield. Never mind. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Oh god. Uh, yeah, time to go. Right. Uh, that was probably a bad idea. Yeah, probably. Okay, I'm gonna grab some more ammo so I can. Actually, I think that's about enough ammo. I mean, I'm out running the barrier, so at least there's that. Uh oh. Yes. They got an enemy on there. Enemy, over there. They're on the tail of an enemy. Ideal. I'm almost over to you. I see you in the distance. There's more ammo. I finally caught up to you. Whoops, I actually hit the click button. Oh, fire, you're gonna... You give away our position to, like, other teams that way. <laughs> Alright. I accidentally clicked. That was my bad. That was okay. Okay. Playing with fences. Who's that? This... Okay. Ooh! A treasure pack? The fuck's in treasure pack? Yeah, good job with the evac tower. We're gonna need that, possibly. Um, oh yeah, a treasure pack. Um, so it will like give you like stuff when you like go back into the menu. So like, oh. yeah. I'm gonna open. Oh wait, somebody else already opened this. Um. Ooh, I'll take that and that. An oh, another treasure pack. Got that, I can't that. collect it, so okay. I already have one. So yeah, no, you can only yeah, you can only collect one day. Um. So there's, there was somebody over here. Oh, darn it, get out of the circle. Oh. Yeah, it's okay, I'm good. Oh, they're in a way distance. They're a sniper. Oh, they're a sniper. For sure. So. Just keep running. Oh, God. 
Brennan. Good Brennan. Find some place to sit down. I'm down. Oh, they just ran past me. Okay, so I'm gonna go over here. Should I just come up to you? Oh, we're not got. Huh? Oh, you're also down. Did you see how I was? I did all kinds of really amazing moves. Yeah, that guy soloed us. Oh no, it was a team. Uh, well, I am... I'm level 2 I'm now. Gonna... You got your first uh, top 10. Uh, how, do I, how the fuck do I use a treasure pack? Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. That's what you got from the treasure pack. Holy fuck! What? You got three legendary shit. Is that good? Holy fuck. Yes, that's really good. <laughs> open the... Open it again. Open the next one, yeah. Oh, I got a skin. Yeah. For a character you don't have. Yeah, for a character I can't even use. Yeah, they're a speedy little guy. They also have a like little jump pad that you can use to propel yourself. Wait, I also have a, a skin for her or something? You have a banner. A oh, banner. Wow. Wait, why is it still saying that I'm level 1? But it says level 2 oh, here. No. <laughs> My game oh, glitching no. powers have activated. <laughs> sure. Also, uh, Aderna, I know you're going to be happy for this. Instead of drinking vodka, which isn't exactly the best to help you stay awake all night, I decided to have apple juice instead. Hmm. Are you proud of not being an alcoholic? I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm proud you're not being an alcoholic for once. <laughs> so. You probably didn't see what I did in that game. Nope. What I did was, so, like, my character allows you to, like, create, like, to, like, warp from one place to another. Oh. So, like, I warped behind the enemy team. Well, two members of the enemy team. There was another one right behind me. That's why I died. Because uh -huh. I didn't notice that there was somebody behind me. Well, I didn't know there was someone behind me. Not that I didn't notice. Okay, let's see. Okay. Bookworm hey, expected me to say coffee when I was talking about the drink I was drinking. Coffee? Yeah, coffee. Depending on how that affects you, it could make you more tired. Oh yeah, no. Coffee doesn't work on me at all. Same here. Well, my reason is narcolepsy. <laughs> I guess my reason is ADHD. <laughs> Wait, it says you're in a match. What the hell? I'm not in a match! I'm clearly right here! 
I don't know why it says you're in a match. It's just weird. Okay, so let's see. One sec. I'm trying to figure out how to... Oh, there we are. Earning privacy. Are we kidding? Are you kidding me? Oh, wait. Duh. That's... Okay. <laughs> um... Oh, shit. You want to try a different mode? Uh, sure. Okay. So this mode is called control. Well, uh, okay, so like we can either choose between control or team deathmatch, but oh, actually no. In thirty seconds, it's gonna go. That comment's gonna change. But... What are you doing? It wouldn't let me do it anyways, because <laughs> they're not online. Oh my god. My god. Yeah, and also a book from with coffee. If I ever drink Starbucks, it gives me the shits. Hmm. I don't know why. I can drink regular coffee from a coffee maker. Just fine. The second I drink coffee from... Starbucks, I'm on the toilet. I like this one. The Range Runner ones were nice. It is confirmed that I, I am it. allergic to Starbucks. That's why I should never drink Starbucks again. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, uh, yeah, the thing I drink at Starbucks Bookworm is uh, Frappies, not lattes. Frappes? What? Is it they're pronounced frappes or fraps? Not frappies. Oh. They didn't say anything when I said that, though. <laughs> also, is it weird that I... Uh, uh, speaking of uh, Starbucks, is it weird that I eat ice a lot of cold things when it's winter time? Oh, there we are. Like ice cream and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Oh, there's only twelve players. Yeah, there's only twelve players in this room, not sixty. Oh. Because these modes are we're uh, completely different. Oh, um, you first. I don't know which one next. I should go. Fuck it, I'll go with it. Oh, wait, I should. Meh, nah, that's okay. I'm fine. You, you can change your character anyway. Uh. Oh. Uh, okay. But the funny thing is, my character has a vendetta against the character of the other, the, of the other person. On our team. Okay, so let's see. Or had it been better. Close quarters. That's what I'll go for. Oh, we have infinite ammo. Yeah, we have infinite ammo. I'm probably gonna die. I'm gonna follow the MB MVP. Wait, wait, they got the MVP status? Oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, like, yeah, it's probably good to stay stick together as a team, honestly. Right now, at least. Okay. Wait, did he just like do a? I can't tell if we're losing or winning. We're losing. They already killed the other three members of our team. <clears throat> Probably because- Oh, fuck. Don't die, Adrena. Oh, fuck, I couldn't- Oh, they were behind me. They were behind and in front of me. I killed- I was yeah. the only person on the team to kill someone? <laughs> Good job. <laughs> what is this a thing? Attention. I got killed from behind, so that's why I wasn't able to kill anyone. 
That's a lot of people dead. To breathe, yeah. Okay, where are you coming out? Side of the rock. Look, reload, 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 reload. I'm behind you. Fuck. How awesome was that rush? For me, I mean. For you, not so much. Holy fuck, there's... They were beside me, too. Yeah, they, they're really good at teaming. We're getting our butts kicked. Yeah. A banana is your MVP. <laughs> Prepare the potassium. Oh, that's our that's our ally. <laughs> I shot our ally by accident. More she did. I am somehow still alive. Uh, our MVP is dying. Oh, they're dead. Oof. Oh, gotcha. Got one. Attention. Delivering care package. I do like that gun, though. Man. I might change. I'll probably change weapon. A trail to unscotty. None of you can hide from me. Damn it. Damn. I definitely need a better... I used my ultimate I saw where they all were at and they are all hanging out together. Right? Yeah. Just wait for a second. I'm gonna come and we're gonna. I'm gonna create a barrier. One sec. Three, two, one. Ooh, Jesus. We got right. I tried using my shield. Try to get my shield back up and died. God, sniper. So they got, they took down. Oh. No, you're not allowed to die. Oh my god, three of them are like literally on the same team. So I'm pretty sure they like play together regularly. Got one! He fell and well, he went to add a shield onto himself and I just unloaded a full oh, clip into him. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Oh, that's... The friends are enemies. I got surrounded. Oh, how awesome was that rush? I don't even know where anyone oh, yeah. is. For you, <laughs> not so much. I'm trying to go. I'm gonna go. Throwing an ox down. They are all together. Just letting you know. I'm still very proud that that guy just jumped in front of me. <laughs> he went to heal himself, and I just unloaded a full <laughs> clip into him. Yes, three, two. I'm gonna have to bring this up sometime. Let's bring it up about here. I got your back, turn. I'm behind you. Casting a third. Behind you. I got. It. I at least tried. Oh, I was killed from behind. Okay. Yeah, they're gonna win. <laughs> That's okay. This is a completely different game mode, so it's... What do you think about this game mode? It's alright, it's fun. And also humorous, especially when that guy <laughs> jumped in front of me. This, this mode... Like requires a kind of a different kind of like. Oh god, that's you. Like I see different characters like for this mode. No... Wait, what the? F Why am I still ahead of? Why am I not bottom? I have the lowest amount of points. Because you have two. Oh god. What the fuck? Now I'm at the bottom. <laughs> that makes more sense. Got two people in the last ten seconds. I guess hit leaf match. Uh, well, yeah, I would say wait. Ah, oh, wait. See. Are we wait until we see the results? Oh, I just propelled myself, like, all the way up. Okay. Yeah. That's funny. Wait, I don't see you on the list. Where the fuck are you? I'm the catalyst. Oh, you're a catalyst. Okay. Yeah, it, it just, like, for, forgets my name, the name that goes with my... I don't know. It's weird. Okay. Let's see... <laughs> Bookworm, the enemy team is harnessing the power of Uwu. Yep. Yep, that's what they did. Okay, so let's see. Do you want to try control, and, or do you want to do the, uh... I got a purple, is that good? Regular... Huh? Yeah, purple skin. Ooh. Oh, I got him. Awesome. Well, you didn't get him, but you got a skin for him. Wait, why is he, everyone... Up in the... Oh, you have to go to Badgers. Threat level. Oh, wait. Yeah, that's for each one. Uh, go team up wheel. Uh oh, oh, sorry. Oh, you can, you can just go to your own character. Go to team up wheel. Hollow sprays. There you are. And you can mm. like add that if you want to. Yes, and just like you, Adorno. 
There we go. Oh, I also... Oh, yeah, you're gonna get used to it. Yes. Oh. oh, fuck. No, you can use that. I can? Oh, yeah. well, I don't have any spots available. No, I just... So, yeah, I don't... I don't use that one. Alright, let's do this. <laughs> you got his skin, you skinned him. <laughs> this is bookworm. I'll go with her again. Actually, you know what? I might actually go with... Okay. I haven't tried her before. So. Well, like, much. I haven't tried her much. So I guess I gotta get I'm... to a certain level to unlock characters. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll just, like, gain more things and you can, like, unlock characters in the future. Ah, uh, okay. Like, how... Yeah. You have to get, like, 12,000. Like, you either have to, like, buy them or you can unlock them. When they fall, we rise. Um, I guess I'll... I'll have, oh yeah, they, they have to choose. So, they're going with them. I think... I want to go... You know what, I really like her. I'll go with her. MVP of their team. Uh, player 2328 is the MVP. <laughs> Oh yeah. Funnily enough, I didn't. I I actually got the name of the the player. Uh, so that's cool. yeah. I'll use that setup. Oh, and I gotta I, select I spawn. I guess now. here. Yeah, you have to select spawn for here. Um. Sure. Group of three. Going that way. Okay. Oh yeah, so yeah, on this one we're uh, on this one we're um, we're getting like the like areas. I see. So it's, wait, where's that sniper from? Whoa, okay. Run, run, just run, keep running, keep running, you don't... It's safer to go inside. Wait, where the... Oh, Jesus Christ! I got headshotted! I am spawning on the point. Giving my shields a recharge. I got one. Oh, it helped. Bitch. Oh, I am so fucking dead. <laughs> I I hit a lot of people. Oh yeah, also in this mode, uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, we don't have access to like healing things, but we our health like automatically comes back. Ah. Let me steal that. Uh, 
Iron hole. We're doing great so far. I died instantly. <laughs> I at least hurt them. Well, we technically have more bases than they do, so that's a good thing. Oh, I put it on that one. Oh, you literally just told me that kill. <laughs> I thought there was a glass wall there. Yeah, there's probably a glass wall. Um... Let's go... Where am I? Yeah, I'll do that after. At this point, I think I only assisted people. I don't think I actually killed. <laughs> More than I've done so far. Oh. Ah. Three. Two. Oh god. Darn it. Shield back. I know ground yeah. Okay. Oh. Right, go behind you. They're they're taking the Oh god, they are taking the thing. Damn it! You don't They're low. The is, do you? I think we got him. Got some of Okay, I got that. That will be useful. But where's his? Okay, so that means that. So we're gonna have enemies on our base now. Really? Spawning at our base. Yeah, we got a respawn beacon near our base. I help us. Oh wait, I actually killed someone. I'm gonna stay here to make sure that. Okay, one. I wounded someone. What were you doing? Traves not only your kill over your noggin. I mean, as long as we keep our point, we should be fine. Wait, can I actually drive that? Oh my god. Yeah! 
I'm into battle now, bitches. I have a car. Right, you're not going right. Oh god. But that's not what I meant to do. Come here, damn it. I wanted to hit someone with the car. I learned that from an old friend. I did no damage. <laughs> Oh god, we really need to take that second base now. Yeah. Well, like, we're still in the lead, but yeah. Definitely. With them coming over here, it's definitely a... Okay. There's someone coming over towards you guys. It's underneath. Okay. I saw him in the distance. Yeah! Fuck you! I can down one of these, like... Yeah, I got one! Oh wait, it's the same guy who killed me! Yeah, fuck you, bitch! <laughs> There's an another person coming over here... That's... Oh, I had to reload! Oh god, are they taking the point? Yeah. That's why I'm been over here, making sure that they don't take it. I'm coming. You died to a girl? <laughs> That's an interesting username. You died to a girl, help me! <laughs> god damn it. We were doing so great at the beginning. Oh yeah. It was because they oh, got shit. the like they got that. Oh yeah, that thing's gone now. Yay. Okay. <laughs> now we just need a gr oh fucking cunts. Okay. I just jumped off the ledge. <laughs> Yeah, we lose. Oh yeah, no way we can come back from that. Yeah. Oh sh Jesus, I got surrounded. Damn, they're stomping you now. That's because they, like, literally put a beacon, like, by our spawn. Uh... Like, by... Well, like, by our, uh... By a... That's why they were able to, like, get us. They put a beacon by a... When people left, that's why, too. Uh, oh, I got two kills. Good job. Um, something's supposed to happen? Yeah, leave. Oh, I, I last one, it just automatically put me in the lobby. <laughs> I think it like puts you in the lobby like after a bit. Earn 5,000 oh. experience. Wait, what? Oh yeah, earn 5,000. That was that was like a, probably a goal or something. Uh. Okay. So now. Let's come back, please. Come here. Alright. There's a lot. I'm gonna go back. Her. Okay. 
There are certain ones I'm like comfortable with enough that I can play well with, but there's like some I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not comfortable at all. All right. Or I don't like really know. I just want to play with them. Well. Yeah. All right. Mostly because I don't like really play with them much. Oh. So. No I know it's you. No heart to calm. Our path is made today. Perfection. And no one else. <laughs> Yeah. We have to get Bookworm in our team, Moderna. Well, that'll be fun to have Bookworm play, but I don't think he has the game yet. Wait, I'm a jump master. Uh, no. I'm the jump master. Follow my lead. <laughs> no way. Pretty sure there's gonna be a team trying to jump on that. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, bookworm. Fine. Uh, so just one more team. Okay, so we're going out. Oh! Interesting. So we're the only ones going over here, so let's go over here. Oh. But some people are already dying. Interesting. Yeah. That's... <clears throat> this game goes by really fast and like a lot of people like to go to the same place at the beginning. What happens if I punch this? Damn it, I was hoping it exploded and I'd die. <laughs> Round one. Beginning ring countdown. The next ring's far. Grab the grab the it. Oh, it's far? Eh, it's not too bad. Shouldn't be able to get to it. Oh shit, a purple there. backpack. Yeah, good. Good pick. Oh, bleh. Okay. Uh, there is a new that's not. What is that? Careful, no kill leader. Uh, I also have this weird shield thing. It's called uh, the heat shield. Oh yeah, no, keep it. That's that's what I use to like make sure to like keep you alive last that time. Oh, that's what that was. Yeah. Extra supplies here. Use Ooh, yes. advantage. Grabbing this one. Switching it out with this one. Um, grabbing that. Scope. That. Okay. Oh, I can't use that. There's a Phoenix shoot uh, kit here. We have another arc star. The ring is moving, Hawaii fighters. No one is inside. No, oh, come on. I was deciding my guns. Okay. Ooh, I'll take that. One seventy. Oh yeah, I forgot this character has. Ooh, actually, that's really good. Um. So package being delivered. Standing by for care package. Yeah, I'm gonna need another. I'm under fire. Oh fuck. I'm Wait, what the fuck? Eliminate the enemy. Okay, so enemy there's somebody over here. Target Might die. Oh, yeah, they beat me. 
Where did they come from? I have no clue. They came out of nowhere. I did add it to my library. I haven't. I just haven't played Apex like at all. all. So Bright won't be the oh, newest okay. player on the team. <laughs> okay, so Brooklyn does have it. They just don't have it installed. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, so that would probably like take hours. Yeah. Unless your like computer is able to like download six and sixty gigabytes in like ten seconds. It, Bookworm, is, do you have the, the ultra mega supercomputer? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I did nothing. I'm like, dang no. Because damage. I actually kind of like this one. Oh yeah, Booker, Mike. I saw that you saw the uh, special um, you know, thing that happened with uh. The little sweetheart sunshine. Oh, I'm first. I am with you, and you are with me. And today, oh, we so fight. you're going with me. Okay, I'll go with. Magical. I'm a Introducing your champion. And yes, she is a trans witch. <laughs> oh. Yep. I might actually be able to get one sec. I am the grim trans witch your parents warned you about. Ah. <laughs> well, that confirms it. <laughs> okay, so where... So yeah, there's gonna be more scenes this time. Um, uh, oh, well, they're mainly all leaving. <laughs> they're all leaving. Uh, I'm just like making sure that. Okay. Power, shooting star. Okay, seeing where all the other teams are going. Where's that team going? Going down there. Okay, so they're going down there. There's another team going over here. With my eyes. Okay, I'm gonna go over here. It doesn't look like anyone's over here. I just have to get stuff quickly because there's a team right over there. Oh shit. I did not mean to pick that up, but that works. Wait, Wait what? No. Long ammo. But what did I just also drop? Oh. I'll take that, take that. I have right here. Oh, one sec. I'll drop it for you. Is distant. Wait. The winds. Oh, yeah. Oh. There you go. Grab that. That'll be useful. Oh, yeah. The ring's still oh. far, and we have 45 seconds to change that. Wait, where the fuck did you go? Oh, you're up there. Oh, I'm... Yeah, I'm getting some stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm moving quickly because I know that there's a team over there. So, okay. And they're... Okay, let's grab that. 
Right, where were the... I'll just go grab your the, like, ammo you tossed out. Yeah. So it should be over by the boxes. Oh, you know what? I think I'm gonna grab this. There you go. Ourselves there and fast. Okay, so yeah, let's start running over there in a bit once we like make sure we have everything. Alright. I would scan the area just to make sure. Oh father, give me sight. Nothing. Okay. Let's go. Well then, we have a care package on the way. I'm just had to pick something up. Okay. Uh, crap. Okay. Let's go. New kill leader. Oh okay. <laughs> wait, there's there's one person who just has the word bots in their name. They died. Oh well. The bot wasn't strong enough. Wait, there was an actual... Were they actually a bot, or is that a... I don't think they were. They just had the word bot in their name. Okay, so... No one's in this area. Currently. Wait, let's switch. No. Whoops, wrong one. Wait, wait. Oh, did I pick it up actually, or? No, I picked it up. It wasn't. Ah. It wasn't the. Uh, you don't have like the weapon for that. Okay, so let's see. Um, God damn that. it! It's two hundred and two hundred. Okay, so there's some more Syringe here. syringes up here. I'll grab some. <laughs> Oh, I'll take that too. That'll be really useful. I'll grab that. All right. Since you don't have the like gun for that. Yeah. So bad we haven't found any like um, what's it called? Uh, any energy mags? Ah. Uh... I mean, the one I'm holding, I use energy to shoot. No. I'm only holding this because like, that's yeah, long range. <laughs> magazine for like that kind of thing, yeah. Okay, um... Actually, I'm gonna go over here. I hear so, people. Yeah. Okay. Jesus. Shot! Oh. Shooter! Need a bit more power. Yeah. Hey, use your scan. Scanning the area. No hostiles. Uh, you were scanning the wrong area. <laughs> oh well. The the shot come, came from that way. Um. Uh. Okay, so let's... I'm okay. not going to try that again. I'm going to go this way. Oh, I see them. Scanning the area. It doesn't reach that far. Okay. Just come over here and... We're going <gasps> to... There's a guy on top! There's a guy on top, I'll go get him. Where? I, I, oh, there's two. There's two. There's two. I got them. One sec. Oh, I'm gonna die. I'm dead. <laughs> 
I damaged one heavily. Because they didn't notice me at first. Beautiful. Okay. Um. Alright, level four. Let's see if I get anything good this time. No. <laughs> Wait, load out. Charms. Yeah, right. Since you got like hmm? So there's a go go over to Swore. Go to Mythics. Ooh, you have enough for one of them. Okay. So you can like just scroll through. Might. There's one. Oh yeah, there we go. There's one for Bloodhound. Hmm. I'm not so, sure what oh, the fuck so now this you're does. Not gonna... Okay, so now you don't have your just your hands. You're gonna have that when you come. So you're gonna be holding that like. I'm sure what <laughs> just like in GTA I have my bloody hatchets. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh yeah, and it's called Raven's Bite. I see. I did nothing. Wait, what? I did nothing. Just don't I... look into any neighborhoods of minorities. Fuck you, buckworm. Okay. This will probably oh, yeah, be the last the match. Oh, sorry. What was that? Oh, yeah. I said, by the way, in this uh, game mode that we're currently doing, it's uh, there's only two members per team. Ah. Oh, so this is probably gonna be the last match of the night. Oh shit. Because I gotta continue the horror story stream from last night. From, uh, from last night. Okay. But I'm definitely gonna include one stream night where it's just this. That's the party boat, okay. Going over there is probably not a good idea. This Let's go jump like in the lava. Actually, I was going to go over to the lava area. Oh, we're, we're just left. Yeah, we're the here. only two left. Um, yeah, going to the lava area. Oh, I was just saying jump into the actual lava. No, we're not going to jump into the actual lava unless you want me to, like, 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 you can actually, like, survive for a bit, for a little while in the lava. Is so. someone shooting us? Yeah, I'm pretty sure somebody was shooting at us. Wait, I still only have fists. Damn. I have to there equip might it? might be some way you can get it. I don't know. You might have to equip it, like, from the thing. I don't know. 
I don't have one of those, so. I'm closing. Okay. What the? Why did you write? <laughs> yes. Why? Because I can. Mr. Forward. Just what I wanted. There we go. Come on, grab. Okay, I'll just grab those two. Grab that. Uh, oh, well. Fuck that kill leader then. Oh, there's another one not open. Oh shit. I'll take that. Should we start moving? A bit. I'm gonna go grab some more stuff. Well, we're gonna be we're gonna be fine for like at least another half a minute. Actually, eh, less than half a minute because it's already coming. Attention, delivering care package. Back back here. Level one. Supplies coming in. Jesus, you scared me for a fucking second. Cause I just turn around and just see your face in front of me. That. Ooh, I will take that. That is much better than what I was holding. I'm gonna switch that. Okay, we gotta go. Gotta go. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, right yeah, we definitely gotta go. Uh, oh. There we go. Anyone tries to follow us that way, they're... They're... Gonna get... Caught. The anus fucked. What? <laughs> no. Be aware of the new kill leader. What fell? I don't know where that fell. That's right here. Grab it. Oh, Jesus. I got it. It's fine. Die. Oh, a crow. Oh, Shield. Okay, go on. Oh, look, something. My arch nemesis is right here. My hole? Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. I was scared that there was like a uh, enemy. I'm like, oh, oh Jesus! Being shot at. And I'm out of the ring. Oh, they're coming around the box.
That was an interesting last match, uh, Derna. <laughs> yeah. Really fast last match. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're gonna dance on your body. <laughs> Load out. Oh, yeah, so you, you can. I would choose. Oh, go to banners. You go to pose and. I honor those who face, not those wait. Who wait, 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 wait. Get that. This? And clip. Yeah. Reason, equip that. There you go. Equip that. Ah, there we go. And go to uh, finishers and see if you can, like. Oh no, you didn't get it. Um, maybe go to emotes. Okay, you don't. Wait, I still have 600. Uh, yeah, you just got 600. You haven't bought anything. Yeah, I wonder. No, you Collective. don't have. A... I honor those who oh, that's a melee them. weapon skin. You should have that with you. Oh, go to equip. Right? You uh, go to the right. Equip. There you go. Now I have my hatchets. You want to try it with a hatchet this time? Yeah, let's do one more oh, round because that round did not go well. <laughs> Yeah. After that, then um, we'll go to horror stories. Oh. Let's do this. Okay. He's pretty good for this. Mm. Do this. The butt buddies will not be separated, says Book. Yeah, because Book is now hatches in the game. <laughs> Damn it, I was about to invite Hatch. <laughs> Your champion. Do this. I am the hunter the gods have sent. I will guide us to victory below. I am the jump master. No. No, I am not. I'm the jump master. No straying now. Better to have friends at your side than at your funeral. I just realized I literally drank half of my orange apple juice right now, and it's a two liter bottle of apple juice. I have not been paying attention to how much apple juice I've been drinking. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I think friends at your funeral would be good. <laughs> Oh Jesus! Oh, like I think, I think she. Oh yeah, I... you can fall a lot. Fall, fall. You can okay. fall pretty far. So. We have the benefit. We are inside the ring. Bathroom break after this match. Nah. I'm 
Look, if you need a bathroom break after it, you can go get a bathroom break. Nah. So you're gonna force Bookworm to... Wait, what? Matt just puts on the floor of the book! Oh, she has a main shot at. And I don't even have a gun, I just have a hatchet. Oh, this will work. Good gun. Um, Why is there electricity uh, coming out of this gun? Oh, it's a shotgun. It's. It's a really good shotgun. Um, right? Yeah. Just wait. Don't bring people over here. Okay, so... Okay. So one of them has... A, what's her name? We are inside the ring. Not face. Oh, we're inside the ring? We're already, we're already inside of it, yeah. <laughs> Bookworm's not praising Dave. No one. Wow, just door on me. Okay. Oh wait, I'll drop. One sec, I'll drop that for you. Since you're using... Yeah, I thought I'd decide to use a long range instead of keep using short. They're bright. There, ah. grab that. That is much better. <laughs> Drama! And it goes to teach you, kids. If an elevator is falling, just make sure to jump at the very end so you don't die. Because you won't die if you jump at the exact moment it's about to hit, hit the bottom of the elevator. Okay, first. All I remember is being shot. I don't know where it came from. Listen up, people have been through here. Attention, the champion has been eliminated. Alright, is that from where we came from? I don't know. I got a little disoriented coming from that. Actually, no, I don't think that's where we came from. Okay, so I think there's a team close by. Let's be careful. Got it. I'm being very careful right now. Right. Yes. I'm coming. Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Yeah, after this match, we'll do horror stories. Uh. Hey, Jerry. Are you, ha are you happy I was able to kill some people instead of not being able to damage anyone? Right. I expect you to always be able to kill at least one person. <laughs> you mean herself? herself <gasps> wow. Her, like... no. <laughs> oh, actually. Never. I was gonna, I was gonna... <laughs> I, I, was, I was like meaning like her like streaming career to actually. I was going to say oh streaming God. career. Right You're just burning her more. That's what true friends are for. <laughs> that is what friends are for. I'm coming, Aderna. Slowly but surely. No, no, like make you be seen by them more. Okay, so they're probably over here. Okay. 
Yep, they're, yep, they're over here. Uh, there's like two teams over there. Run. I'm running. Oh, I'm being shot at badly. I'm gonna die. Oh god. I died. Oh, I see them. They're over by that bridge over there. By the bus. They're... Oh, they're coming on me. Oh, they, they, they're, they're, I'm gonna die. Oh, yeah. We survived longer. No, we didn't. Well, last round we were at 11, now we're at 9. Well, that just means more teams died. So, yeah, we survived longer. Oh, wait, did we act? Oh, we went through trios, I guess. That's good. Okay. Just a bit longer, says Buck. <laughs> well, I guess we actually did, because, like, we got to where the ring had all the... Yeah. Uh, Buckhorn is wondering what the semicolon symbol mean in your badges. Oh, oh. it's um, I forgot. <laughs> um, it's uh, suicide awareness. That's what the semicolon is uh, for. Suicide uh... awareness. Yeah. Which I think it's fine to say because we're talking about like awareness. being aware yeah, yeah the awareness of it and stuff so it's like yeah alright <sighs> so like does this mean y'all are playing as literal social justice warriors this book Uh, yeah, I guess. Actually, yeah, because, like, um, because of, like, what, like, uh, what's, like, some of the characters, like, storylines go through, yeah. Like, so, right, here's a little bit of a rundown about, like, the world we, you're, you were thrust into. So, we are in this game called the, uh, so we're in this game called Apex, and we're, like, the, we are the legends in the game. So, each character is brought into the legends for a different reason some for like money some for pain some for uh um revenge some for like because they were in prison or to or their family was in prison so like this is quite literally pretty much the hunger games <laughs> yeah so hold on, let me just share my screen real quick, because the first story I'm going to read has a lot of pictures, so it's obvious I need to share my screen. <laughs> now, it's the sci-fi hort, uh, Hunger Games. Ah. <laughs> uh... Hmm. All right. Ouch. 
Jiri. At Jiri. Yeah. Did you hear to see the good news that I posted what on Twitter? Hmm? Someone wants to adopt Sunshine. Oh. Uh, that's yep. wonderful. See, yep. Huh? Uh, I just said, so, yep, yeah, that's it. Like I said, that's wonderful. Yeah. Have you heard the good news about the two of you? <laughs> yes, he's my grandfather. Right! <laughs> <laughs> And Jerry's new husband. No, no new husband. No new husband. <laughs> he also likes the tentacle. He <laughs> <laughs> got sidetracked. Anyway, everyone ready? <laughs> the hell is that? My chair. Oh. <laughs> anyway, everyone ready now? I'll take your silence as a yes. <clears throat> Ted the Caver. March 23rd, 2001. Due to the overwhelming number of requests I have received to tell about my discoveries and bizarre experiences in a cave not far from my home, I have created this web page. I will outline the events that happened to me during these past few months, beginning with my journey into a familiar cave in December 2000. And ending. Well, it hasn't actually ended yet. I will use my caving journal as the text to tell about my recent experience. I will give them to you as I experience them in chronological order. I have included photographs that were taken during my many trips into the cave. I have also created a few illustrations to help the reader get a better idea of what things looked like in the cave. All the photos were taken by me, or one of the few people I went into the cave with. And I want to point out a few things before I tell about the events. One, most of the pictures were taken with a Kodak disposable type camera. I took a better camera into the cave on one or two of, of the trips. Pictures on the site are all original photos and have not been messed with or enhanced, other than were noted. As a rule, I get my pictures put onto disk at the time of developing so I don't have to scan them later. This ensures the best digital quality. 2. I will not reveal the names of the other people involved in this experience. If you know me well enough, you probably know them already. 3. I will not reveal the location of the cave to anyone for any reason, so please don't ask. I refuse to be held accountable for anyone's life but my own. I will refer to the cave as Mystery Cave. That is not its real name. If you think these events sounded far-fetched, I agree. I would have come to the same conclusion had I not experienced them. I will try to finish the site as soon as possible. Check the date on the main page to see when I've made updates. To protect myself from people who might want to copy the site, I included the following. All texts on this and following pages are my own words in copyright 2001. Ted. I will divide the text into two colors for the sake of clarity. The plain text is taken directly from my caving journal. The italicized text is my comment as I reflect on the experience. 
I'll do my best to convey the thoughts and feelings I had during the entire event. I will not use the actual names of the other individuals involved. I will, I will include the entire relevant text of my journal. Only small parts of the journal will, will I skip. This will only occur when the entry has nothing to do with the experience in the cave, such as eating dinner after a trip, getting fuel and snacks, irrelevant details, etc. My first journal is fairly thorough. I will merely summarize what I am cutting out of the actual entry. In an effort to present this experience in as an accurate light as possible, I will type my journal as I wrote it. Scans, rumor check, please overlook my errors. My additional comments will help to clarify the things I wrote in my journal. Caving Journal, December 30th, 2000. B and I decided to get in one more caving trip before the new year, so we set our sights on Mystery Cave. Not a spectacular cave, but since neither of us have been caving in a while, it would be nice to go to any cave. There was a bit of excitement to this trip. There was a small passage in the lower portion of the cave that I wanted to check out to see if it was possible to get past it. It was a small opening, but lots of air blowing out of it. Even though it was way too small to climb through, I had never even checked to see what was inside the passage. We got our gear loaded up and hit the road by 3 p.m. We got to the cave in great time since B likes to drive fast. We anchored from the usual tree and began to rappel into the cave. I went down first and got my gear together with while B came down. I will refer to B many times. We have been caving together for many months now. He was injured in a caving accident a few years ago and was told he would never walk again. Through hard work and perseverance, he not only walks, but he can get around very well in caves. The trickier parts of a cave might slow him down a bit, but he can make it. He patiently works through an obstacle until he gets past it. As for the reference to the small opening in a the cave, there is a saying among cavers, if it blows, it goes. Meaning, if a passage has a good flow of air, it is probably worth investigating. After we explored all of the unusual passages, we climbed down to check out the hole. The hole is located deep in the cave, near lowest part of the cave. It is on the side of the cave wall, about three feet from the floor. To look inside the hole, I had to kneel down and duck under an overhang of rock. The original opening, I put my glove in the hole for size reference. I used my backup mini mag light and held it inside the hole to see what I could see. I was excited about what I saw. The wall around the hole was about three to five inches thick. It led into a tight passage. The passage opened up a bit just inside the hole. It continued back about 10 to 12 feet in a small crawl space. After that, it seemed to really open up. Although, how much, we couldn't tell. This could be a version passage. Obviously, no one has passed through this route. But there could be a way into the passage from the other side. To even get to the crawl space, we would have to enlarge the opening. Currently, it's about the size of my fist. Once we get past the opening, we could have a tight crawl back to where it opened up. It would take some work, but we thought we could do it. We sat down for a few minutes to rest and contemplate our plan of attack. While we sat there in the darkness, we could hear the wind howling from the other side of the passage. It was low, eerie noise. We could hear a 
a low rumble from time to time. No big deal, though. The cave is in the vicinity of a highway that has heavy trucks drive on it. I figured the rumble was the effect of the trucks resonating through the rocks. We determined that our best plan would be to haul a cordless drill to the cave to drill into the rock. Then we could take a bullpen and a small sledgehammer and break up the rock. It seemed pretty straightforward. We would widen the hole big enough to squeeze in and see what was on the other side. The efforts to haul all of the equipment down to the hole would be a pain. But we hoped it would be worth it. I named the passage Floyd's Tomb after Floyd Collins. It seemed to look like a tight spot where Floyd spent the last... It, it seemed like a t the tight spot where Floyd spent his last miserable days on Earth. Floyd, Co Floyd Collins was a caver back in the early 1900s. He got stuck in a tight crawl space and was unable to free himself. It is an amazing story that is detailed in a book called Trapped. The Story of Floyd Collins. I think that was the title. I don't recall the author. Point in our passage, Floyd's tomb was not only a joke to Floyd, but a commentary of the size of the passage. <laughs> in retrospect, it is funny how simple I thought it was going to be. I was going to take... I doubt I would have been, even begun the project. Had I known what I was going to experience in the cave, I never would have returned. We gathered up our gear and headed to for a surface. Normally, I w couldn't care less if I ever came back into this cave. There's nothing special about it, but now I was psyched about getting back and getting through. We haven't even left the cave, and we were planning our return trip. The rest of the journal entry talked about the climb out of the cave, our dinner, and our trip back home. January 27th. The 28th, 2001. V and I were both excited to get back into the cave and get to work. I feared with about four hours work we could be in and see what was on the other side. We had arranged to borrow a Dewalt cordless drill to bring with us. We also had a masonry bits to drill with, sledgehammers to break up the rock, bullpens insert into the drill holes, and a few other tools that we ended up not using. Getting the tools down to the work site proved to be a challenge. One of us would climb down the rope and stop at a ledge or good resting place. Then the other person would lower the tools. We kept repeating this routine until we got to the bottom of the cave. Then we had to drag the tools to the hole. took about an hour to finally get to work. B took the first turn at the hole. After an hour of exhausting work, we could tell that we were not going to get through in one session. We kept trading off after we worked ourselves into a sweat. One would take a break and get some food and water, while the other went, went to work. The routine went like this. To begin work, we had to get down on our knees and do our best to avoid smacking our heads on the ceiling. Working in this awkward position, we, we would trail into the wall around the hole. That was difficult work. We really had to push on the drill, and it was still slow progress. Then we inserted the bullpen into the hole and hammered on it until the rock broke up. Then we would repeat the process. To give you an idea of how slow it went, a typical size rock that would break off was about fingernail size. If we broke off a large piece, it was cause for celebration. From time to time for variety, we would just wail on a cold chisel with a five pound sledge. It was slow progress. The problem with the sledge was that we couldn't take a good swing because of the tight quarters. 
Even though we spent many hours and several trips working on the hole, we never did find a better technique for widening the hole. The trill bullpen hammer got the best results for our efforts. We came up with some crazy ideas for breaking up the rock. Everything from TNT, the hole in a generator, to the mouth of the cave and running an extension cord down to a jackhammer. We even thought about using liquid nitrogen to freeze the rock and make it more brittle. After a couple hours of hard work, we realized that our limiting factor was going to be. It was about then that our first battery met an abrupt death. We had a second battery, so we swapped them out. The second battery lasted a little longer because we hammered and chiseled a little more often and a little longer each time. Finally, about after about three more hours of drudgery, the second battery died, and we called it a night. <sighs> we could tell that we had done some work in the cave, but it was not much. For first time since we got in the cave, we sat back. Both of us took a break. It was nice to check out the results of our hard work. Then we noticed the howling again. It seemed to be a little louder than the last time we were there. We just figured the wind was blowing a little stronger outside. What we could not figure out was the rumbling. It too seemed to be louder and more frequent. This time we could not attribute the noise to trucks. The road that the trucks drove on was not very busy to begin with. At that time of night it should be dead, yet the rumbling continued. It seemed to be coming from deep within the passage. B said he would ask some veteran cavers what could be causing the noise. We didn't spend a long time admiring our work. We still had the hole to gear up and out of the cave. Actually, we left some of it in the cave. It was still difficult work. What made it worse was that we were both exhausted. Our original plan was to be done with the cave and hit a couple of other caves in the area the next day. Instead, we decided to crash at a nearby motel, charge up the thrill batteries, and go back to the mystery cave. My journal goes on a length about the night after we left the cave. We got a room, dinner, it was excellent, I didn't sleep good despite the fact I was exhausted, etc. Both slept in, so we got a late start back into the cave. The second day working on the cave went about the same as the first. We worked until both batteries were dead again. We were still not even close to getting through. The howling and rumbling continued as the day before. On caving. Before I continue with the next journal entry, I thought it might be helpful for the reader to explain a little bit about caving and about the atmosphere in the cave. As I reread and think about my description of the cave, I noticed that much of the language I used in my caving journal, the descriptions or lack thereof, assume that the reader has a knowledge of caving and what it's like inside a cave. In other words, I write my journals for me. I will take this time to give a more detailed description of the cave. I will tell about what it was like while we worked on the cave. And I'll summarize our feelings up to this point. The cave was discovered several decades ago when a construction in the area unearthed its entrance. From that time to the present it has been visited by mostly locals and area and avid cavers in the region. Beer cans can be found intermediately in the cave, most in the upper half. When the cave was first entered, it was probably beautiful. Dust, graffiti, vandals, pigeons, and regular use have diminished its appeal. There are still places in the cave where small formations remain undisturbed, as a reminder of what the rest of the cave used to look like. To enter the cave, one must have a good length of rope in order to rappel down into the rock. A nearby tree serves as a good anchor point. Once the rope is tied to the tree, 
about 20 feet away from a small cliff. It can be tossed over the edge of the cliff to a small ledge 15 feet below. Cavers can then descend the short distance to the entrance. Once inside the cave, artificial light must be used. My light source of choice is a battery-operated helmet-mounted light, known as a tag light. Safe caving calls for at least two sources for backup lighting. For my backup lighting, I have a mini mag light mounted to my helmet and another helmet mounted light in my pack. I have also have glow sticks that I carry with me. These are not considered good sources of backup light by some, but they are good use for taking lunch breaks and they could be used to get out of the cave if the other sources fail. After a short climb over large rocks, the caver comes to a large pit. The same rope is used to reach the bottom of the pit. The drop is only 50 feet or so, but it's not free hanging. In other words, you can't slide straight down the rope, which is preferable. You have to snake your way down sharp rocks as you descend. The ascent is made more difficult for the same reason. The pit varies in diameter from about 10 feet to 3 or 4 in a few places. The walls are lined with sharp white rock called popcorn. Let me correct that. It used to be white, but it is now covered with dust and dirt that was kicked down from above of years of caving. Popcorn makes it painful to brush against the side of the pit. My choice of clothing is Levi's t-shirt, gloves, and knee pads. I usually leave the cave with a few scrapes, but at least I am comfortable while I climb around inside. The temperature is stable year-round. It feels cool in the summer and warm in the winter. We have gone in on freezing days and 10 feet into the cave. If it is warm enough, that coats are not needed. It is good temperature to work in, as we learned. For this size drop, I usually use a figure 8 descending device. For the climb up, up I attach myself to the rope using a pencil ascender. But I climb up on my own without using the device. It is there merely as a safety attachment. In case I slip, other cavers have their own methods of getting down and up. At the bottom of the drop, the, the caver gets to do some crawling for a while. There is a small room, about 6 by 6 feet, at the bottom that gives the caver a spot to leave his harness and descending, descending gear. So there's no more steep drops. The harness is not needed and it will only get in the way. Once the caver gets down to the 6x6 room, he can take a break under a ledge while the rest of the party comes down. Then he must drop to his knees and to negotiate a 10 foot long passage that is, the, that is only a few feet high. This is where the knee pads come in handy. The floor is covered with soft dirt intermingled with bits of broken rock from above. A thin layer of dirt does nothing to soften the blow to the hands and knees of the caver. Works down to the crawl space. As a reward at the end of the crawl space, he gets to drop his belly and scoop under a tight squeeze. Not really tight, just something low enough to make the caver scoot along in, in the dirt. Once the caver gets on the other side of the squeeze there, a few speed a feet of crawl space. Then the cave opens up enough to stand. For most of the rest of the cave, the caver can stand or at least stoop. The cave splits off into several passages at this point. Two routes wind around the rocks and crevices and come to an abrupt dead ends. The other two lead to a small pools of water. Each route is fun to explore. They all lead on for a hundred feet or so and a gradual downward slope. Most of the time the caver can walk upright in the passages. 
Other times, he will have to climb over large boulders or occasionally crawl on hands and knees. Water is a common occurrence in caves. I have been told that one of the local residents was one of the first people in the cave. And then his cousin drove into into the pools using. Oh, sorry. Why don't we reread that? I've been told that one of the local residents was once the first people in the cave. And that his cousin dove into the pools using scuba gear. He said that the cave continued down for a couple hundred feet underwater. What they were hoping for, and what happens frequently, is that the passage comes up somewhere else, with fresh and cave passages to explore. Unfortunately, I don't possess the knowledge to give more detail about the types of rocks in the cave. When we were drilling, we would have some parts that are easier to drill than others, and there were different colors in the rock. But that is the best I can do to describe the makeup of the cave. At the point, the cave splits into four routes. The two passages that that dead end are to the immediate left of the caver, straight ahead and to the right are passages that lead to pools of water. The entrance to the passage on the right is the largest of the four. The arced opening rises nearly ten feet in the air, ending a mere foot up below the cave ceiling. As the caver enters the passage, the ceiling gradually lowers until it is about six feet high. It continues at the same at the same height for the forty feet that the passage travels in a continuous direction. The section of the cave resembles a hard rock mine. Its arc nearly perfect, and the floor flat and easy to walk on. It's easy to picture rusty mine cars on rail lines, and dust-covered miners with blistered hands gripping dull picks. The pseudo-mine comes to an end, and the caber is once again forced to drop onto hands and knees and get reacquainted to the floor of the cave. It's time to crawl. It lasts about 20, 20 feet. The floor is slipping gently downward for the first half of the crawl, then it gets fairly steep and slippery. April body cavers can still climb carefully down the slippery slope. When I go to the, with B, I carry the end of the rope that used to get down to this to this point. I usually need to tie another short length of rope to the, the first rope to make sure he can use it to reach the bottom. The crawl lasts a few feet beyond the bottom of the sl slide. Over the next 10-12 feet, the caver slowly begins to regain the standing position. After walking a few feet and climbing down a short drop off, Caver arrives at a small level area, which has a passage leading down immediately to the left. The passage ends 75 feet later at one of the small bodies of water. To the right is a rock wall. Straight ahead is an indention in the wall, which goes back about 3 feet. On the wall at the rear of the, in of the indent is a small hole about the size of a softball. To get near the hole, the caver ducks under an overhang and kneels upon the rocks that rise above the floor by a few inches. By the time the caver reaches this point, he is either warm or sweating. And the first thing he notices is the cool breeze blowing out of the hole. It was my recognition of this hole as a potential doorway to unexplored portions of the cave that ultimately led to this telling of my experience. As has been my tradition for all the years I've been caving, the party reaches a point in the cave, usually at the deepest part of the cave, that all lights are extinguished. Complete blackness fills the eyes. For a moment, the individual caver strains the eye muscles, focused in and out with an expectation of catching a crumb of light somewhere in this false night. 
After several futile moments, the caver turns his head at a sound, perhaps another caver, only to have the other senses return and then heightened. The sounds, smells, and feelings that have been overlooked to this point came racing to the caver in perfect detail. The pain of their own behinds sitting on the cave floor, the smell of dust, sweat, gano, the sm sound of modern materials shifting an old eight old rock as cavers attempted to find comfort on a solid foundation. At the back of every caver's mind at this time is what if what if a person had to climb out of the cave with no light? Would he make it? Would he find all the turns and bends which got him to this place? If not, would a rescue party find him in time? The depth of darkness recognized at this time is something that is rarely experienced outside a cave. Many first-time cavers erroneously declare that they have, have to hold their hand to within two or three inches of their face before they can see it. The truth is the human eye is incapable of seeing in an absence of light. They did not hear something coming towards them. They would feel it before they saw it. Complete and total darkness. This exercise is a great way to remind people to take backup lighting. As we proceeded to work in the cave, we developed a system pretty early and little change in, in succeeding trips. The first time in the cave, B took first shift at chipping away at the opening. After about a half hour, he needed a break, so I took over. He told me what worked best, and I continued doing the same. We would try new things from time to time to use new muscles, but usually stuck in the same method. We would use the masonry bit and press on the trail as hard as we could and trail out at a hole in the rock. Safety glasses and dust masks were worn while working. Then we would insert the bullpen and hammer into the rock and break out small chunks of the cave. Then we would trail another hole and repeat the process. Occasionally the trail would hit a soft spot in the rock and that step would be shortened. We would work until we became too tired to continue then B and I would trade. While one of us was working, the other would remain in the darkness and either eat or drink, or just lay down on the cavern floor, padded by rope bags. After just a few rotations, we were tired enough to catch a nap while taking our break. The only light we used was the helmet light on the head of the worker. Since it was pointing toward the hole, the resting person was left mostly in the dark. This was a welcome benefit since the resting person was usually well resting. The rest break was also a chance to cool down a bit, which didn't take long in the cooler temperature of the cave. Unfortunately, the temperature of the cave allowed us to work pretty hard and not overheat much. I remember that frequently looked I remember that I frequently looked in the hole and thought, hey, if it's big enough, I think I can squeeze through, only to be disappointed in my attempt. However, even after the first attempt and failure, I knew that I would keep working on the hole until I got through. This despite the fact that I knew it would take many more hours of hard work. It actually became an obsession with me. I tried to get out of the cave and work as often as I could. Hope that the passage led to a larger undiscovered cave that we would be the first ones to enter. I guess the explorer and me wanted to find a new frontier there in the cave. Since B is such an avid caver, he was motivated by the same desire to find a new unexplored cave. What we did find was not at all what I expected. February 10th, 2001. Scarcely two weeks had gone by and already we were on our way back 
out to work in the cave. We admit we had become obsessed with the idea of getting through the passage. That may be a sign of how exciting our lives really are. It's not that we think there's, there's going to be something great beyond the passage. We just like the idea of being the first humans on the face of the planet to set foot in a version part of the cave. Although, if we found a hidden treasure, that would be fine with us. We got a late start and drove back part of the way in the dark. When I tell people that I go caving at night, they wonder why. They don't think, stop to think that it's always night once you're inside the cave. On the way out to Mystery Cave, we talked about new ideas to speed up our work. B also told me he talked to some caver friends of his and they came up with an explanation about the rumbling noise. They thought it might be the sound of water deep within the cave, possibly a waterfall. They couldn't really explain why the noise seemed to come and go. To me, it is just one more reason to get through so we can solve the mystery. This trip we took B's dog, Whip. She is a Jack Russell Terrier. I was not at all concerned about taking the dog into the cave. We have taken her before. She answers the call of nature before we go in and then waits until we get out again. Also, she is well behaved inside the cave. We simply had to lower her via a custom made harness until she reached the bottom of the main drop. Then she negotiated the rest on her own. She loves to explore, but won't go out of our sight. She doesn't have a light attached to her, so she has to wait for us. Another pers another reason I don't mind bringing Whip along was because we planned on putting her through the small hole and see how far into the passage she would go. That might give us an idea of what is, is on the other side. We knew that if there was a drop off that we couldn't see, the dog would turn around and come right back out. We thought we might have, have to do some work on the hole even before even the dog could get through. Despite working in the dark of the night, we were able to rig up and get down pretty quickly. We didn't take as many tools as last time, plus we left some in the hole so we wouldn't have to hold them out and back in again. I did manage to get two more batteries for the drill for a total of four. Also a few more masonry drill bits, even with the dog, we made good time getting down. Then something bizarre happened that I can't quite explain. The dog began exploring as soon as we let her off the rope. She was in hog heaven, sniffing and darting around our feet. She would run from one person to the other as we made our way back to the work site. At the point the cave splits into four passages, the dog seemed to run out of juice. She just stuck right by either B or me. That seemed kind of odd. As we progressed further into the cave, she would only stay by B. She seemed edgy, like she saw something she didn't like. As we approached the short drop off before the hole, she stopped and would only come further after we co coaxed her. The hair on her back stood on end. Finally, as we got to within 20 feet of the hole, she began to whimper and hide behind B. Her tail was between her legs, and she was carrying down on the ground. Strange. I've seen her square off with dogs twice her size, but now she acted as if Satan himself was lurking in the darkness. I fear it must have been animals that used to be. I fear there must have been animals that used the cave as a home and whip smelled their scent. Too bad if it upset her because there was no way she was going into the passage. We decided that with this new development, one of us would work while the other stayed with the dog a few feet away from where we normally rested. We got right back into our routine for drilling, hammering, etc. With our extra supply of batteries, we were able to really push hard on the drill and not have to worry about using up the batteries. 
This did not make our work any easier, but it did speed things up a little bit. Progress was still slow. I d really don't mind it, though. My journal goes on for a while about the progress we were making. The entire time we worked, Whip did not move. We just lay there on a rope bag, shivering. She would whimper from time to time. One thing I didn't think about at the time was that she would not take her eyes off the hole. She would... She, we should have been more observant of this intuition, intuitive animal. We were on our fourth battery when the second bizarre thing happened to us. The bee was working. We had just finished drawing a hole and was getting ready to hammer the bolt. And when he stopped working and looked into the hole, I was kicking back, almost asleep, and hardly paying attention to B. He had a light by his head to illuminate the work area. I could see in the eerie glow a puzzled and intense look on his face. He looked over at me and shook his head. I asked him what was up. He said that he swore he just heard a strange noise animating from the hole. He said it sounded like a rock sliding a rock. Sort of a grinding sound. I assumed his ears were just ringing from the drill. He assured me he heard what he said he heard. I didn't have an explanation, so I went back to dozing. B sat in the quiet of the cave for a long time before he resumed work. Also, he would stop from time to time and just listen. B is very grounded and not one to pursue some imaginary sound. I believe he heard something, but I'm not too concerned about what it was. I assume we, we will, will figure it all out once we get through the passage. The final battery lasted than another hour or so, we were sitting around talking about our progress when I decided to see if I could get my head through the hole. My head easily fit, but there was no way my shoulders were going in. As I was kneeling there, contemplating how close we were, we were, I noticed something that B overlooked. The wind had stopped, and at all times I've been in a cave, I always felt the wind blowing. The last time we were out working on the cave, the wind was blowing worse than ever. But earlier we remembered the breeze cooling us off, but now nothing. B said he did not know when it stopped. The rumbling had ceased. Too bizarre. This plain old cave was becoming mysterious. We talked for some, for a long time in the dark of the cave. We debated what could possibly be causing these unusual events to occur. I think part of the reason we were sitting in the dark was because we were both too hammered to move. We would come up with no reasonable explanation for the strange things happened. For strange things happening in the cave. After sitting for at least a half hour, we slowly loaded up our gear and started for the surface. We couldn't have been happier to get out of there. Once again, he left some of the tools in the cave. We just put them in the hole. Not enough people used the cave to worry about. Plus, we were too tired to care. We made a lot of progress on this trip. It helps to have batteries. We still have a long way to go, but it sure is nice to see how far we have come. The rest of the journal entry talks about climbing out of the cave, getting to Roman Motel, and crashing. We are, We were beat. In retrospect, I can't believe how casual we were about everything that was happening in the cave. At the time, we, the only thing we could think about was getting into the passage. Everything else was just minor distraction. I do recall thinking that it would be nice to, to get in and see how the mechanics of the cave worked. Now weeks later, I think my ignorance and naivety and shiver. March 3rd through 4th, 2001. It took us three weeks before we got back out to Mystery Cave again. Our attitudes have changed a bit since we first started the project. 
in the beginning, we looked at the whole thing as a fun adventure. Since the last trip out, we found ourselves taking a more serious approach. On the drive out this time, our con conversation was a little more subdued than before. We hadn't talked much since the last trip. Instead of discussing ways of getting through the passage, we found ourselves talking about rational explanations for what had happened. Neither one of us had any ideas that would explain the unusual occurrences we experienced on the last trip. We were amused to find out that neither one of us had talked much about the last trip to other people. And as a complete reversal from the other trips, it has been fun to report to friends and family about our progress. It is always fun to tell people about the tight squeeze we are going to have to go through to get into the passage. Most people have little desire to voluntarily subject themselves to incredibly tight spaces. Actually, neither do I, but I will do it in, in order to get to the other side. Good motivation. We left town early in the afternoon to beat traffic. I don't really recall what time we finally got to the cave. Like I said, the mood was subdued. We got rigged up and started down. Obviously, B left the dog home this time. We took essentially the same gear as the last time. We left some of the tools in the hole to save our backs. The agony of holding the extra weight. Even with the gear, we got down in good time. We really have a good system for getting up and down. There was only one minor mishap this trip. B scraped his arm on the descent. Not real bad. Fortunately, he waited until we got all the way to the hole to patch it up. It was just a superficial cut. While he was getting the wound cleaned up, I started working. We both took a note that the breeze was back in the rumbling. Present. We had four fresh batteries and four fresh arms. I had high hopes this would be the day. I started out pretty slow when the first started working on the hole and the thickness was about three inches. As we have enlarged the hole, the, the thickness ha has increased. As a result, our progress has become slower. Still, we continue with as much energy as we could put into work. The hole was big enough, at least, for me to put the hammer into the hole for reference. Then put the camera into the hole and take a picture of Floyd's tomb. It's been nice to see a pile of broken rock below the hole get bigger and bigger. We have both realized that we are doing what we have both realized that we are just going to have to put in a certain amount of work in order to get through. So we just get down to business. We don't usually talk much while we work, since one of us is making a lot of noise with the drill or hammer. Break times are used to chat momentarily about whatever topic pops into mind. Breaks take place whenever the guy that's working decides to switch roles. We both put in some pretty good work sessions. I have a little more stamina than B, but he gets just as much done in a shorter amount of time due to his upper body strength. We still celebrate the small victories we encounter along the way. Whenever a section we've been working on crumbles, we cheer. On rare occasion, that fist-sized rock falls from the entrance. We whoop and holler. That's one small chunk of earth that no longer s separates us from whatever lies on the other side. I still harbor the fantasy that there is a hidden entrance to the other side of the passage. And years ago, Spanish explorers hid their treasures in a cave and sealed it up the entrance. And it has remained untouched until we find it. B.S. more realistic, although more mundane theory. Figures there is more cave on the other side. We'll see who is right. This trip out, I wanted to see if we could speed up the work by using larger masonry bits. Purchase some good size one at the hardware store. One was larger in diameter than all the rest. 
the other was a smaller smaller round but longer I had pretty much concluded that the big one might be too big and I was right we tried to get get it to go into the rock but progress was very slow we tried pushing for all we were worth and all we got was tired the larger bit just created too much friction area for our strength we might have worked with a hammer drill but we didn't have one a longer bit worked fine with our drill. We relied on it for most of the work we did this trip. Although we were going to be out one bit and a drill in my hand when the drill broke off toward one end. It was I was pushing as hard as I could on a drill with a, f with a bit a few inches in the wall when it snapped. I nearly ran the drill through the wall from pushing so hard. We were able to retrieve the bit and keep using it minus a couple inches it still worked great only once in a great while did we resort to a hammer and chisel work was proceeding as normal until about the time we were on our fourth battery i was kneeling down and working the drill slowly into the wall at the time i had my earplugs in my safety glasses on and was lost in my own thoughts suddenly over the squeal of the drill Burning down on the rock, I heard a strange noise. It was loud. I can hear it over the noise of the drill, even though I hadn't had earplugs in. At first, I thought it was just the drill bit doing its job on the cave. It would frequently complain by screeching and whining as we forced it into the wall. But this was different. It took me several full seconds to comprehend that this was coming from inside the hole and not the bit. I stopped drilling and yanked my earplugs out in time to hear the most terrible scream I have ever heard trail off and echo in the darkness of the cavern. I stared wide-eyed at the hole. For several minutes I didn't move, nor did I breathe. I turned to look at B. Moments earlier he had been lying on a rope bag catching a nap. Now he was standing upright, mouth open with a look of concern on his face. I turned and looked into the hole again, half expecting to see a demon's face staring back at me. Nothing was different in Floyd's tomb. I fixed my gaze on the back of the squeeze where the limits of my light reached. There was no emotion, only darkness beyond the reaches of my light. The complete silence that followed, I, I could hear my heart pounding in my ears. Not another sound could be heard in the cave. Suddenly I heard a scraping noise behind me. And straightened up. I nearly knocked myself out, hitting my head on the overhang. It was just B moving to turn on his light, but I was so wired it nearly sent me to my grave. B spoke, and again I jumped. He said to get some rocks and put them into the hole. He explained that whatever animal had made that noise might be able to get through the hole. I immediately grabbed a few rocks and hoisted them through the opening, using the handle of the sledgehammer, I slid the rocks as far back into the tunnel as I could reach, creating a wall between us and the other side. Since the squeeze is so small, it didn't take long. The entire time I was doing this, however, I was thinking that the noise certainly did not come from an animal. I didn't know if B really thought it was, or if he was just trying to convince himself. I didn't say anything to him about what I thought. From the time it happened to the Rhino's trail entry, I have tried to come up with the most with some possible source for such a noise. To describe it, I would say it sounded like a cross between a man screaming in fear and a cougar screaming in pain. It sounded like it came from the hole and was roughly a hundred feet away. The horrific noise reverberated through the cave and through my ears. B estimated the scream lasted eight to ten seconds. My best guess is about five seconds. It's difficult to tell how much time passes when you're listening to a solo from the depths of Hades. After I filled the back of the passage with rocks, we just sat there listening to a silence. My breathing was a lot more rapid than usual. Neither of us spoke for quite some time. Finally, B suggested we get back to work, but keep an eye out for movement in the hole. We put a light in the passage that shined to the back of Floyd's tomb. 
It was only at this point that we realized the wind had stopped again and the rumbling could no longer be heard. To say I was nervous would be an understatement. I didn't say anything to B nor him to me. Back to the drilling, B took over the work, which was fine with me. I wasn't exactly worn out, but I didn't mind being further from the hole. B would stop from time to time and listen. I just sat watching him with my light on. I wasn't close to the entrance to the hole, but I still found myself looking behind me, down the passage to the to still water. Every time my light would cast an unusual shadow, my heart would jump. My imagination was running wild. Oddly, B seemed to be less concerned about the strange noise than me. After a short time, he seemed to be focused entirely on getting through the passage. I was still straining to listen above the sound of the drill. I heard nothing but the now familiar sound of carbide on stones. Alright, I, I, this is a break. Because a Derner told me to... I'm just going to highlight that real quick. So I know where to go to. I'll hydrate. Ugh. Thank you, apple juice. So far, it's getting really creepy. And I'll stretch. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, I stopped for a brief moment. Not sure if you noticed that, like, recently. Because Bus made a noise on my wooden bed. And, it, and I, it, it sounded like scraping. So I was like, bitch, the demon enter my house? <laughs> <laughs> so I turned around and it was just Bust. Bust, you scared your, your, your owner. A silly boy. Don't do that. He's just a silly boy. Also, you notice, Jerry, how my voice has not been cutting out? Yeah. Yeah. The reason is I found out more. Granted, it's also a discourse issue. But uh, it was also because I have Xfinity. And Xfinity would be would constantly like leave my room for times. So that's, that's why OBS would get cut off. And my voice would get cut off. Oh. So yeah, I bought a $60 device that forces internet to stay in my room at five bars. <laughs> so yeah my voice will never be cut off you'll always be forced to hear me yeah. anyways break over as I contemplated the possible scenarios which may lay play out on the other side of the passage I found myself strangely getting somewhat excited again about getting through. It might have been fatigue taking its toll on my mind or the thought of something valuable on the other side. My thoughts were broken when B let out a yell, possibly a cuss word. He said the drill battery was dying, but he hadn't quite broken off a large section he was working on he set the useless drill aside and picked up the hammer and bullpen started wailing away at the hole created by the bit after nearly 10 solid minutes of hammering he sat back against the rock sweating and nearly out of breath the bullpen was still protruding from the cave wall he held the hammer toward me inviting me to take a few swings I held up my hand and shook my head i had been ready to exit this cave for quite a while now. He didn't press the issue. Without speaking, we both started gathering the gear we were going to take out. Once again, he stashed some of the tools in the passage. I was the first to start toward the top of the cave several times. I had to stop and wait for B, not because he was moving slow. I was just more than eager to get out. Few times have I felt better than that night. Stepping out into the chilly night air. 
Our channel talks about the rest of the evening, our dinner, our decision to get a motel and come back the next day, our lengthy discussion on the strange sounds we had heard, other mediocre night's sleep. I cannot believe that we were will so willing to get right back to the cave after hearing the scream. Part of the reason I went along with the idea was because B seemed so indifferent to any possible dangers. Even if it were an animal, weren't we possibly putting ourselves in harm's way? In retrospect, I still have difficult difficulty understanding our thought process at the time. We were just too eager to discover virgin cave passages. I now think it can be summed up with one word, testosterone. February 13th. It's amazing what a couple of good meals and a little sleep can do for someone's attitude, even though we still had memories of the strange noise fresh in our minds. We relit our fire of enthusiasm. This, the other side of the passage seemed so close. We were sure this would be the day. We got to the cave and started to work our way down to the hole. Getting back into the darkness of the cave brought back the memories of the night before. The sight of the circle of rock illuminated by our headlamps and the smell of dirt in the air. This, the sound we made as we crawl across the rock. Once we reached the entrance of, to Floyd's tomb, however, we were once again ready to blaze the trail leading to an undiscovered part of the cave. We immediately noted the presence of the breeze blowing out of the hole and, and the rumbling. The bullpen sticking out of, the, of its hole was an obvious sign of where we needed to begin work for the day. We took over where he left off the day before. I took up residence in the same spot I occupied the night before, even though I was already well rested and wanting to start work. B was making the hammer sing with each blow. After a mere two or three minutes, he left, let out a cheer. He, he, he turned to reveal a handful of rock that used to be attached to the cave. He was breathing heavily, but had a big smile on his face. So did I. For a time, the strange noise had been forgotten, and the vision of success captured our attention. The lower left corner of the hole had been giving us grief because of the thickness of the wall at that point. We felt that if we could just remove that corner, we might be on our way inside. B now held his hand. The crumbled remains of the corner. Our excitement consumed us as we examined the hole. I took a hammer and pounded away at the surface of the hole. The idea was to re remove the jagged edges that would take their toll on my skin. The size looked right. Now the moment we had been waiting for. I cautiously approached the entrance to Floyd's tomb. I decided the best way to enter the small hole was to place one arm over my head, turn my head sideways, and right. so. Hmm? Yeah? I think Discord has started giving you the middle finger. God damn it. Fucking hell. Uh, go back a bit. The left hand corner of the hole had been giving us grief because of the thickness of the wall at that point. We felt that if we could just remove that corner, we might be on our way inside. Being now held in his hand, the crumbled remains of the corner. Our excitement consumed us as we examined the hole. I took the hammer and pounded away at the surface of the hole. The idea was to remove the jagged edges that would take their toll on my skin. The size looked right. Now the moment we had been working for. I cautiously approached the entrance to Floyd's tomb. I decided the best way to enter the small hole was to place one arm over my head. I turned my head sideways and slowly worked my way in. I soon determined this was not going to work. The hole was small. If I was going to make it in without widening the hole anymore, I was going to have to put both arms over my head in a diving position, turn my head sideways, and slip into the tomb. 
The width of the entrance was the limiting factor. The height was sufficient. The arms overhead position flared my soldier blades out, but there was still room to get in. Plus, the arms overhead gave me the best squeeze side to size. In order to enter straight into the hole, I stood on my feet and bent over to get level with the entrance. My, my knees were bent. The position was uncomfortable. Sort of a semi-squatting position, bent at the waist with arms overhead. Plus, I had slightly turned my upper torso to the left in a counterclockwise rotation to negotiate the angle of the entrance. Notice in the last photo that the entrance generally slopes up to the right. I cut my arms through the entrance with minor scrapes. Next came my head, but keeping it turned sideways, I was able to get in, for the most part, up to my shoulders. When I got to my shoulders, I could feel the rocks touching all around my sh shoulders and chest. I could feel the rocks touching all oh, Whoops. It was not stopping me, but I definitely sc scraping many surfaces of my body. I decided to just push through. Keep in mind that I was going to have to come back out eventually. The pain was not bad, and I was in. Well, my upper body was. At least I can get a good idea what the tune was going to be like. Once inside the tomb, I had a few inches all around me in, in which to position my body. This was the largest part of the passage, and it was conveniently located right at the beginning of the crawl. And it gave me a little room to get positioned to, to crawl further into the passage. Inside the tomb gave me a whole new outlook of what I was going to be like to crawl through. Even though this was the largest part of the crawl, it was still small. I could move my head around freely, but every direction that I turned, I was staring at a wall of solid rock. When I spoke to B, my voice sounded muffled, like I was talking in a small box. I could rest my chest on the passage floor, but the rocks were uncomfortable. I turned my head to look further ahead, but couldn't see past the wall of rocks I had built the day before. The squeeze toward the end of the passage was closer now, and appeared even narrower. I didn't know if I could squeeze through or not. I knew it would be close. I just wanted to crawl further into the passage. First, however, I had to work to get some of the loose rocks that were lying on the passage floor out of my way. I was disappointed to find out that most of the rocks that looked loose were actually attached to the floor. I was hoping to be able to just scrape them out of the way. I had pushed the sledgehammer into the passage before me, so at this point I used the pushed rock wall we had made further back into the passage. Then I dragged the sledge back and forth across the floor to move any loose rocks or break up solid ones. By sliding the head of the hammer under the squeeze, I determined that the narrow, narrowest part of the squeeze was about 7 inches high. I figured we would have to do some work before I could slip through. The entire time I had my head in the passage, B was just kicking back listening to my descriptions and progress reports. At some point, he snapped the photo shown above. Thanks, B. Up to this point, the size of the passage was not too big of a deal. I was an incredibly I was in an incredibly small passage, but only my upper body was in. And since it was the largest part of the passage, my arms could move freely. I was pretty calm. Then it was time for a push. I slid the sledgehammer up as far as I could reach, since in order to rotate my hips to the proper angle to enter the hole. I had to lead up my upper body up on my forearms, use my feet to climb the wall and outside the hole and slowly crawl into the hole. My hips barely fit. Once they cleared the entrance, I could relax a bit and get in position to work toward the squeeze. I decided to try the one arm forward technique to get through. The passage was so narrow that whatever position I started with, I would have to stay with through the entire length. 
There is just no room to move around or change positions. I would also have to turn my head one way or another to keep it in the same position. This crawl was tight. Moving forward at this part of the passage was relatively easy. I could use my forward arm to pull and my other arm to push. At the same time, I would wriggle my body, trying to arc as much as I could to keep my chest off the rocks. I tried both ways and determined that I would turn my head to the right. It felt the most comfortable. I began to learn things as I went. I determined that a small flashlight in one hand would be nice. Then I could shine it ahead and get a better idea of what I was about to crawl over. This was a difficult maneuver because I had to look overhead since my head was turned. It became immediately obvious that we were going to have to do some more work removing rocks from the passage floor. As I moved along the surface, I was constantly scraping my chest on the rocks. They were sharp and it was painful. Occasionally, I would cause a rock to slide along under my chest and actually wedge me between it and, and the top of the passage. I would have to back up and either try to move the rock to the side with my cheek using a sweeping motion with my head or back way out and move it with my forward hand. My little trip to the, into the passage represented a major milestone in my caving career. When I began caving, I did not feel overly comfortable going through tight spaces. Even the little squeeze at the beginning of this cave was an obstacle to overcome. By pushing myself and forcing myself to, to try the narrow passages, I have become much calmer about tight spaces. Since this passage represented a new benchmark in small spaces, I had not been faced with anything this small. I don't remember having to take off my helmet before now. With this passage, it is mandatory. As I mentioned before, not only do I have to take off my helmet, but I have to turn my helmet head to the side in order to fit. The journey into the tomb went like this. After I had twisted my hips into the passage, I took a few minutes to stop and work out a game plan. Most of the length of my legs was still outside the entrance. They were just dangling in the air. The tomb was big enough to move my head around and even more my arms freely into position. It was larger than the rest of the passage, but not by much. It was like sticking your head into a box. Everywhere I looked, there was a there were rocks, and not too far from my head. Any sound I made was muffled and dead. The narrowest part of the passage was about ten feet in. At this point, I was about three and a half feet in. At about the four-foot mark, I would have had to commit to whatever position I felt comfortable and stay that way until the twelve-foot mark, at which time the cave started opening up. I went with my left arm forward and head turned to the right. B had given me a flashlight that held in my left hand. As I inch forward, I would try to brush the loose rocks away with my left arm. This was somewhat successful, but there were a lot of rocks I missed or could not move. As mentioned, the first little bit of the crawl moved along fairly quickly since there was a little room above me to negotiate the packet passage. Then the wall started to close in around me. At a few extra inches on each side of me, but the top of the crawl was getting very low. At about seven foot mark, I could feel the top rubbing my back as I would arch. After another half a foot, I could not arch anymore. I just had to push ahead with my toes and pull with my forward arm. I decided it would be a good time to see if I could get could back out. I tried it. It was pretty easy. It gave me a lot more confidence. Still, I had bead tie webbing to my feet just in case he had to pull me out. My neck was starting to get sore from being cranked to the side. My head was getting heavy, but to rest it, the only option I had was to lie down on the broken rocks. It was painful. But I did it frequently. I was staring at the wall to my right, 
It was a mere four to five inches from my face. Most of the time I wasn't watching the wall. Either I had, had my eyes closed or the light wasn't shining in a direction that did me any good. It was very quiet in the tomb other than my own breath. I was breathing heavy from the effort it took to move. Thankfully the breeze was present and cooled me off. By lifting my head and carefully touching the ceiling from time to time, I could gauge the size of the passage that my body would soon pass through. Much like a cat using its whiskers to gauge an opening in a fence at the seven and a half foot mark, I could tell things were about to get real tight. While lying in the darkness in a passage deep within a cave, one is in a unique position to ponder mountain literally resting on top of me, the entire earth lying below, one tiny movement of earth and I could and I would cease to exist. Or worse, to recognize the fear shared by Floyd Collins as he lay there, trapped for days deep within the heart of Mother Earth, incapable of freeing himself from, from his earthy earthen prison. Picture yourself in my position. Lying on your stomach, your arm, left arm extended over your head, your right arm is at your side, having only a few inches in which to move. Your arms and hands are sore from, and bleeding from crawling and pulling yourself across the broken rocks. Your entire body is resting on the rocks. Your neck gets tired from holding your head off the rocks, so you gently rest your cheek on the rock to rest. Once you start again, you have to push yourself you have to push with your toes to scoot your body forward, sliding across the rocks. After moving a few inches, you are breathing hard and have to rest. As you inhale, you can feel your back pressing hard against the top of the squeeze. It takes several minutes before you recover enough to press forward. The entire time you are lying there, you think about how you're going to get back out and what if. Oh, that's pretty much what I was going through at that point in the passage. I decided that this would be a good time to throw a photo of the squeeze. The photo was actually taken on a different trip, but it shows how tight things were at, at the point in the passage. Notice my head turns to the side, and you can see how I would rest my cheek on the rocks. You can also see how difficult it is to look at around. You can also see how difficult it is to look ahead of me. My arms are pinned to my side. There is officially no space between the top of the passage and my back. Tight, not for claustrophobically inclined. When I reached the point where my back was rubbing and I could feel my, with my head and the passage was not getting bigger. I knew I was most likely not going to get through. Still, I decided to give it one more push. If I had been in this position a year ago, I would have been in a state of panic, but not today. I was pretty pumped. It took a few minutes to rest, then I went for it. I exhaled completely all of the air in my lungs. This caused my chest to collapse enough to scoot forward a few inches, because it takes so much effort to scoot. I only went a few inches before I had to stop and breathe. As I inhaled, my chest pressed hard against the floor and my back against the top. It took a little longer to get my breath back. Unbelievably, I did it again. Exhale, scoot, rest. Again, only a few inches. Repeat, I took several extra minutes to enjoy this position, pinned in the small passage. Wow, I could not believe how relaxed I was. I tried one more time to exhale to scoot and scoot. My back was rubbing too much to continue. Despite the failed effort, I was psyched. I took several long minutes to lay there and recover from the effort. B had been encouraged me the entire time. It was fun to hear him cheer as he saw my shoes go deeper and deeper into the hole. Backing out was not too difficult, but it did take some work. I encountered the same obstacles as, I, as when I went in. After I wriggled my hips out of the hole, which took some time, I had trouble getting my shoulders out. Both arms were overhead at this point. My shirt was getting caught on the rocks and my, sh my shoulders were bruising. 
my shoulders were brushing the sharp rocks after struggling to find a good position. I gave up and just pulled my upper body out. Scrape. My body pulled up over my head and I had some nice scrapes on my shoulders, but I didn't care. To me, this trip was a success. I had pushed myself beyond what I, th what I thought was possible. I kneeled at the entrance and looked into the narrow passage I had just been in. The rock wall was now at the 11 foot mark. The smallest point was at the 9 foot mark. We were close. Between the work and excitement, I was tired. I just sat on the rope bag, grinning. Oof, what a trip. The rest of the trail entry talks about the usual. Our climb out, dinner, trip home, etc. On our way home, we brainstormed and came up with some ideas that would help us get through. We both invented some tools to remove the rock on the floor deep within the passage. We were both very excited by this trip. I from pushing my limits in the cave, and B from a success in climbing out of the cave. This was the first time we was able to climb all the way out without the help of climbing devices, nor my help. It was a personal success that showed the progress he had made since his accident. Pretty cool. I remained amazed that we could so easily forget the terrifying moment we experienced just the day before. All had been forgotten, the strange noise being blamed in our minds on some rational, harmless explanation. April 7th, 2001 Prior to going out, back out to Mystery Cave again, we spent a lot of time preparing. We made a squeeze box, which is a wooden box, the opening of which can be adjusted in size. We could then crawl through the opening and measure to see how tight of a squeeze we could fit through. From that, we were able to determine what, that I need about 8 inches in height to get through the smallest por portion of Floyd's tomb. That meant we would have to scrape out about an inch from the floor of the passage. We also learned that the best position I would need to get through the passage would be on my stomach with my hands by my side, and of course my head would be turned one way or the other. That position allowed my shoulder blades to drop to their lowest point. In order to move, I would push forward or backward with my toes. It sounds difficult, but felt adequate. Later, it proved to work sufficiently. The second thing we did to prepare was to construct the tools we invented to work with it within the cave. I came up with a clever way to chip away inside of the passage without having to climb inside. I had my neighbor weld thing weld together several lengths of steel pipe in a manner that would allow us to take it apart while we climbed down to the tomb. But still we have a strength necessary to hold up to a blow from the hammer once it was together. We made our own tips that we could could screw into our pipe to reach the area we needed to work on. He came up with a cool design for a scraper using angle iron. He and his neighbor welded it together. It proved to be an invaluable tool for scraping and removing the rock. We were both proud of our inventions. I also made a device to hold my drill that attached to our pipe. We ended up not using it since the scraper device worked so well. Okay, so I have to go to the bathroom real quick. Um, have she, a good pee. Yeah. Jerry, Adorna, you, you control stream. Bookworm, don't cause chaos. What? Why couldn't she have just said she's going to go? Right. We, we should make a pee song for Bright. Did you just say we we have to make a P song for Bright? Yeah.
you know what? Just because Demon Mama has a song doesn't write me song. Bookworm, Aderna, do either of you agree? With Spood in that bright needs a P song. Okay, it sounds like Aderna has no opinion on Bright getting a P song, and Bookworm seems to like the idea. So it's 50 50. Well, I think it's a little more towards P song since it was literally your idea, food. Unless you're not for your own idea. <laughs> we just have to make the lyrics and the tunes. Who would sing it? I'm not exactly a good singer. I'm not a good singer either. I'll admit, no matter if it's this voice, my real voice, or my fake voice, I have a monotone voice as a whole. Oh, that's a good idea, Derna. Momo has an amazing voice. I could try to write some lyrics. I not, I do not know anything about writing uh, instrumental sounds or anything. But as someone who is primarily good with poetry, I think I could figure out some music lyrics of Bright going to the bathroom. Would it be beautiful lyrics? Are you asking me to make beautiful lyrics about <laughs> Bright going <laughs> Spoon? <laughs> You're not much into the whole comedy lyrics. That's a fair note. I'm not exactly the best with comedy. I'm as comedic, comedic as a stone. Well, except the stone would be funnier because you can hit someone with it and people could be like, ha ha ha. What? What? Food. <laughs> you know what? I would really like a mango popsicle. Right now? Yes. Not even in the bath? No. Are, are you just doing this to... Get me all the room? Yes. Now, what would happen if I say? Nothing. Nothing besides talking? Yes. And pee pee talk? What the hell? <laughs> How about this? If I make lyrics for a bathroom song for Bright, you help me because clearly you're better with comedy. Uh, will your ADHD uh, allow it? I might allow it later tonight. Okay. You're like, I'm going to stay here. It is warm. It is blanket. Blanket. It is mine. Mine is the blanket. Aderna, could you talk during the time Bright is peeing? I think I'm going to go get myself. I think 
people can slowly die. Are you suggesting they died? The zombie apocalypse has begun. The dragon elf is still awake. I mean, not awake. Well, yeah, awake, but they're still alive. They are still alive. They are still aware. I don't know how tired they are from one to ten. <laughs> Maybe we should play still alive. Oh my what? God. What is still alive? From Portal. Portal song. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Would that not be a good tea song? That, for one, that's copywritten. Copywritten songs are a no go. Oh. There once was a bright. She had to go pee. Food, are you suggesting I write it now? No. Right. Went missing. People miss her. Wait, are you suggesting she fell through a portal in the toilet? Well, I mean, I did read a story earlier today. A lady was screaming and banging on an airplane door for help from the airplane's bathroom because she was stuck in a toilet. And the reason she got stuck in a toilet was because it sucked her in. Oh, jeez! So, oh, my gosh! People tried to help her out, and the pilot had to run back there, and he finally managed to get her out. But she was so humiliated after she got pulled out of that toilet. Oh my gosh, that person almost killed by toilet. Yeah, well, at least luckily she didn't have surgery anywhere near her stomach or but yay, yay, otherwise that would have probably ruptured it. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? And you got in that situation and just pulled your intestines out. Oh, why? <laughs> why? 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 I don't know. Food. Alien. I also read a newspaper, a snippet of a newspaper article earlier today. And basically, this airline decided to, like, put windows in the bathroom. Why? Nobody wants a window in the bathroom. You know who complained about it? Who? The people flying first class. They're like, why would you put a window over there? And the people who are working at airlines like, well, if there is someone peeping on you, at 35,000 feet, you deserve to be peeped at. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh.
How dare you, bookworm, go against my words and cause chaos. How dare you? Yeah, it's totally bookworm's fault. No, it's not. Also, bookworm has not caused as much chaos as they could have. They cause chaos with their silence, Jerry. No, no they don't. No? Bookworm's a good being. <laughs> bookworm, is this true? <laughs> Bookworm? Are you a live bookworm or are no, you they're a dead. bookworm? They bookworm just said died. yes, but I don't know what they said to yes to because you said so much. Oh, I, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Well, they're they're on the chat of the stream. Oh, okay. They said, this um, emote says, innocent and good being. Oh. Uh... Uh, I believe you and the I don't say corn. What? Are you saying you believe bookworm and elote corn? Are you, are you adding food into this yeah because we bought those almonds the other day that are elote flavored and we never tried them yet that's a fair point if those taste good i think i'll try making elote at some point i'm gonna want to try it i bet elote tastes amazing all right, let's go over and go back to the actual story. All right. Because I think we're almost at the end, too. <clears throat> I took an oath. I made a vow. I would not leave the cave until I had made it through the passage. Conquered Floyd's tomb. This would be the trip. It had been a long time since we had made, since we had been out to mystery. We had been busy though. We had made t the tools we had talked about. It was fun coming up with ideas for tools. Also, we made a squeeze box to determine the best technique for getting through the tight spot. Plus, we knew about how much rock we needed to remove before we could get through. We were excited to get back out to the cave to finish our project. Our climb down to the passage took a little bit longer than usual since we had extra tools to carry. Once we got down to the passage, we immediately got to work using bee scraping tool with the pipe I had made. It worked like a charm. We could hammer the pipe on one end and the scraping tool on the other end dug into the rock. Then we could push the debris all the way through the passage and out of our way. When we needed to measure our progress, we would turn the scraper sideways in, in the passage and observe the clearance. We worked for about two hours before I had gotten inside the try. The tomb. I just wanted to make sure I was going to make it through on the first day. All right, first try. B made one more sweep of the passage floor, clearing any loose rocks from where I would be crawling and pushing the wall. He had made the back of the squeeze. I had made preparations for the crawl by fashioning duct tape suspenders to prevent my shirt from sliding around while sliding across the rock. I went with a flashlight in my hand, even though my hand would be at my side. I knew I would need it once I got through. As an expression of faith, I did not tie a rope to my feet. I was confident I was going to make it. Finally, I made the attempt. Although, I didn't mention in my journal, we did notice the breeze was back and rumbling present. 
since we didn't do any work at the entrance, I had to go through the same dance routine to, to even enter the passage. Once I got my upper body through the hole, I shined the flashlight ahead of me to work out a plan of attack. The passage did, didn't seem any bigger than last time I was there, but most of the work was done deeper in the, in the squeeze. I paused for a few minutes, then twisted my hips to get my lower body in. I slowly inched forward as my entire body slowly filled the passage. Before I was completely in, I got into position for the push. I dropped both my hands to my side and turned my head to the right. Then I began to inch forward. Once my toes were inside the cave, I used them to push forward. To keep from scraping my body, I would walk using my shoulders, knees, and toes. Progress was slow but steady. That was fine by me. A foot or two before a tight spot, I could already tell there was a little more room. Even so, I began to touch the roof of the passage with my back. This time, however, I was able to continue moving forward. I reached the lowest point in the passage, and I could tell it was still going to be tricky. Even with the work we had done clearing out the loose rocks, I still felt sharp pebbles rolling under my chest as I slid along. When I could feel my back brushing the top of the passage in several places, I reverted to my technique of, of exhaling. Before I began, however, I took a minute to lay there in the passage. I could see the glow of B's flashlight as the ray of light managed to squeeze past my body. I could feel the cool breeze evaporate the drops of dirty sweat on my forehead. I could feel a thousand sharp edges dig into the surface of my skin. I felt the twinge of excitement as I realized that the goal we had set out to achieve weeks ago was about to be realized. This thought alone made me want to keep moving. No matter how tight the passage became, I breathed in and out rapidly for a few moments then began. Exhale, scoot, stop to catch my breath. Repeat. After just a few inches of scooting, I could raise my head off the floor and squeeze and tell that the passage was beginning to open up. I relayed this information to B and we both took a few seconds to celebrate. During the rest of the slide through the passage, B was cheering me on. Virgin Passage and Neil Armstrong, Neil Armstrong Territory were the phrases he kept repeating. I was grinning ear to ear. Even though the passage was beginning to get larger, it was still slow going. I had to continue scooting along for another foot and a half before I could slide my arms underneath me to use them to crawl. At that point, I felt my journey was essentially over. I was able to sit up slightly and move the rock wall. We had wrecked it several trips ago. Those rocks served as a somber reminder that a little caution would be wise. I shouted back to be that I that I was through. We both took a moment to congratulate ourselves on our success. B would likely never be able to squeeze through the passage to see what I was seeing, so I gave him a description of what the cave looked like. At this point, I only had my mini mag, so. I could not see very far into the passage. The end of the passage made a gentle tight turn to make a gentle right turn and seemed to go far a ways. I was unable to do anything at this point but sit due to the size of the passage. All of the broken rocks we had just pushed through Floyd's tomb were around me at this point. There were no other signs of in of human intrusion. I had to wait until B passed me my helmet light to get a better feel for the cave. B used the pole we made to slide me the end of the rope. Then I was able to pull all of my gear through the squeeze. The first thing he sent through was my helmet and light. After I got the light fired up, 
I was able to see our new section of the cave hours. It was an ex exciting experience to see the results of hours of hard work over the course of several weeks. At this point, we still had no idea what the cave had to offer. The only thing I could see was the passage immediately f following the squeeze. I, it was a narrow passage with a low ceiling. I would easily be able to get through it, but I would have to crawl. I began taking pictures so I could show B. I asked B how far he thought I should venture into the new cave in light of strange events that had occurred. For the first time, he too toned down his enthusiasm as he remembered the noises. He slid the pipe through the tomb with a loosened tip on the end. He said I could use it as a weapon if I ran into an animal or... He also told me to make sure we could hear each other as I progress into the cave. Even though we were at least thinking of the possibility of running into trouble, we never really considered the fact that if I got into trouble, B would never be able to rescue me. And in fact, no one would be able to get to me for many hours. If I were in serious trouble, as in hurt, there was no way anyone would be able to get to me in time. But symbolic of the whole experience, we were focused on our goal and not the potential dangers we face. So far, we had dodged the preferable bullet so far. I strapped on my gloves and knee pads, grabbed my camera, and began my adventure. I crawled through the passage pictured above, which was about 20 feet long. At the end of the crawl, the cave bent slightly to the right. I would have to climb up a gentle slope, but then I would be able to stand by the end of the next section of the cave. The next section was about 40 feet long. In addition to having a higher ceiling, the walls were a little wider than the section I had just crawled through. Both sections were relatively straight. The floor was covered with a type of rock which crunched as I crawled and then walked across it. The walls were basically the same as much of Mystery Cave except pristine. It was obvious no one have, had been there before me. On a closer examination of the walls, I found two delicate types of formations. The first resembled several chunks of braided cheese tied together on one end, and the rest of the cheese just flopping down. The second formation was just tiny strands of rock thinner than human hair. It looked pretty cool. I found several examples of both kinds of formations. I was not even through the second section of the cave, and I could barely hear B. Cave passages are not very acoustic friendly. I shouted to him that I would go for a half hour, then return. He said that would be fine and to be careful. Then I proceeded to explore some more. I could walk nearly upright at this point. I was on the third straight section of the cave when I discovered a crystal formation on the wall to my right. It was in several layers on the wall, resembling clear candle wax that was allowed to melt and drip down the wall. There were several small stalactite-looking formations formed by these crystals. The longest about four inches in length. There would have been one much longer judging by the size of the, of the base, but it had broken off. I looked to see if I could locate where it ended up, but I couldn't find it. Passage continued on for another hundred feet or so before the cave opened up a little. It was at the end of the short straight segment of the cave. At the very end of this of the segment, the cave made a bend to the left and opened up into a room. Just at the point where the room began, there was a round rock that appeared to be leaning against the wall. This seemed odd, but singular formations are common in caves, so it is by no means unique. I had crawled and stepped over several large chunks of rock 
that fell down from the ceiling, but this one was more round than the others. Once past the rock, the room opened up to a height of about 15 feet. It was about 15 feet in width and about 30 feet in length. At the far end of the room, there was another passage leading straight out. As I entered the room, I had an eerie feeling. It was like the old saying that I felt like I was being watched. Once again, the excitement of the new find faded. And the memories of the mysterious side of the cave crept back into my mind. Suddenly, I felt very alone. Fortunately for my ego, I was nearly out of time and had to get back to B before my half hour was up. I took several pictures of the room. I was going to just get a feel for how long the next passage was when something caught my attention. On the left side of the room on the wall, at about eye level, I discovered what appeared to be hieroglyphics. It was a single drawing that almost appeared to be just part of the rock coloration. It looked like a very crude representation of people standing below a symbol. I was pumped. This meant that there had to be another entrance to this cave, even if the entrance was closed or blocked. It might mean an opportunity to open it and get B in into the cave. I took another look at the drawing to make sure I could describe it to B. Then I took some more, some more pictures and headed back to B. When I got back to, to the squeeze, I could barely talk fast enough to let B know everything I had discovered. He was just as excited to hear about our newly found treasures. As we debated on what our next move would be, I began to send my gear back through the tomb to be, I told him it would be best if we got someone else to come back with me, in case something happened. He agreed. Once I got all my gear through, I was faced with the wonderful task of having to negotiate Floyd's tomb again. Theoretically, a person should be able to get out of the passage he just crawled through by simply reversing what he just did. If he contorts his body a certain way to get in, he should be able to get into the same position to get out and practice. This may not prove to be possible for pra or practical, such was the case with the tomb. I determined in advance that I would attempt to go ahead first back through the squeeze. I knew that I would definitely make it by going feet first, but that would mean backing up all the way through the tomb. That would take a long time and be very exhausting. My only concern in going head first was when I got to the end of the squeeze, I would have to get through the, the hole we had made through without the benefit of being able to twist my body. Oh well, I chose to go head first and deal with the exit when I got to it. I started into the squeeze, got very close to the tight spot, so at least I would have it over with. At least I would have it over with soon. It turned out to be tricky getting through. I had to shift my hips to the right a little to get through, but I just kept plugging away at it. My hands were once again by my side. My head was just turning to the right and I was scooting with my toes. And once again, I was using my head as a gauge to tell when I was at the tight spot. Then, when I was past it, I seemed to get tired a little quicker on the way out. Must have been from all the, all the work we had, we had done to get through. I was a little over halfway through when something bizarre happened. I was lying there taking a brief break when I heard a sound deep within the cave. It was faint, but distant sound of rock sliding on rock. My blood froze in its veins. I couldn't move. I just lay there, straining to hear the sound again. Nothing. I quickly began to scoot toward the exit. I didn't mention the sound to B, but I did recall one of our earlier trips when B said he heard the same thing. The task of getting out of the hole turned out to be as painful as I thought it would be. And it, I had to put my arms over her he head and force my shoulders through the hole. I definitely left some skin behind as I slipped through. B helped me as I wriggled my upper body out of the passage. Then I could catch myself and ease my lower body out of the tomb. I was out. 
B and I shook hands, began to load up our gear. I was trying to listen to any sounds coming from the hole. But we were making too much noise, gathering our stuff. As much as I looked forward to getting into the passage, it was a relief to get back out. That is pretty much how I feel about caves in general. I love to go in, but I feel good when I get back out again. Something strange happened with the pictures I took in the next part of the cave. Pictures I took in the passage leading up to the large room all turned out just fine. Strangely, none of the pictures taken in the room turned out. Pictures around the rock, and more importantly, pictures of the hieroglyphics I saw. Pictures taken before and after the room turned out great, but the negatives on the photos taken in the room were clear. Nothing. I remember what the hieroglyphics looked like, so I drew a picture to give you an idea of what I saw. It's a crude drawing of what I saw, but it's accurate. First thing I thought when I saw it was Blair Witch Project. It kind of had that same feel to it. This symbol was in the center of the several figures that looked like people raising their hands were below this. April 14th, 2001. This is the last picture before I entered a large room. At the end of the passage, partially hidden in the shadows, is a round rock that I saw. Here's the same picture of the brown rock outlined. You can't really tell from these pictures what you're looking at, but they are the only ones I got of that round rock. Only a couple days elapsed before B found someone who wanted to explore the passage with us. B told me he talked to a few other people who couldn't make it because of scheduling conflicts. He said they really grilled him for information about the cave and about the passage. We would not tell them which cave it was to ensure that we explored it to our satisfaction before we made it known to the public. Even the guy who ended up going with us did not know which cave until we were very close to it. And he was sworn to secrecy that he would not reveal the location of the cave to anyone on the planet. I won't identify him by name, so I'll just refer to him as Joe. Cho, B, and I set out early in the morning to make sure we could spend all the time we wanted in the new passage. When we got to the cave, we were able to rig up and descend rather quickly. It helps when you don't have the whole half of a hardware sword down into the cave. Cho was impressed by our work. Even B and I took a minute to pat ourselves on the back for all the hard work we put in, for the fact that we made it through. Joe is a rather thin caver who has a lot of experience in caves. He said this might be the tightest squeeze he had been in, but it didn't bother him. He knew that physically he would be able to make it since I was bigger than him, and I made it. He was just as excited as us to get through and get caving. Maybe more, he quickly got ready and was ready to hear what the plan of attack was going to be. I figured I would send him through first since he was ready and I would follow. B would pass our gear through and wait for us outside of the passage. B would give us two hours to return. That was nice of B to go down into the cave and babysit us. It gets boring sitting there in a the cave. With our plan set, we were ready to roll. It was perhaps irresponsible of us not to tell Joe about all of the unexplained events that occurred in the cave until after he had gone through. But what exactly do you tell someone? How many, how many of the weird things did we need to reveal to him? We did not feel that we were in any danger, so or we were not going to the cave ourselves. So we did not tell him a thing prior to him entering Floyd's tomb. Of course, when we did tell him afterward, it was too late. I couldn't believe how easily... How easy Joe slipped through the passage. He said it was tight, but it sure didn't look like it. Once he got in, we passed him his gear. Then I started in. Even though I knew I could fit through, it was still a slow trip through the tomb. You can only go so fast when you're scooting with your toes. Then I reached a tight spot of the squeeze. I had Joe snap a picture of me. I thought it would make a good photo. Once I got through... 
B started to relay my stuff to me, then disaster struck. I had gone all the way in and turned around to pull my gear through. I had to kneel down and still crouch down low. I had just got my helmet in light and was turning around to feed the rope back to B when I smacked my head on top of the passage. He went skull versus solid rock. Rock one told B what had happened, so he sent me my first aid kit through. I was bleeding, but even worse, I didn't feel too good. I patched myself up, then told Joe I didn't think I I didn't think I'd better continue. He looked like a little kid who was just told Christmas would be cancelled. Although I didn't like the idea of him exploring the cave without me, I wanted him to at least see the part of the cave for making the trip out there. I told him how far to go and how long it would take. Then I set, sent him on his way. As I lay there, I could hear him crawling into the darkness. His light disappeared after the first turn. I rested a minute or two, then began my journey back through the squeeze. I was disappointed to get all the way to the cave and then not be able to explore it to its end. Actually, it, it, it is killing me. After I got through Floyd's tomb, I sat down and munched on a cliff bar. While B and I chatted, I told him I would pay for a motel room if he would stay overnight. Then he could see how I was doing the next day and make another attempt at the cave. Felt goofy for having smacked my head on the cave wall. B said he was wanting to give it another try tomorrow. He was just as anxious to put some closure to his cave. To his cave. As long as Joe would stay overnight, we determined to wrap things up the next day. Once this was settled, we just sat back and enjoyed the darkness. We could hear no sounds coming from the passage. The sounds reminded me of the scraping noise that I heard last time we were out there. Brought back the subject with B, since I had not explored the cave completely, I could not offer any explanation of what could be making the scraping noise, or the change of wind strength, or the rumbling, or that terrible scream that we heard. Someone we both wished we had not sent Joe into the cave alone. B went to the hole and yelled into it, Joe. No answer. Not surprising. You just can't hear each other when you... You are very far apart in the cave. We nervously waited any sounds. A 20 minute time limit had, had set past, then 25 minutes. I really had no desire to climb back through the squeeze. My head was still throbbing, the squeeze looked tighter than ever. Still, I knew I was going to have to make sure Joe was safe. Just as I was getting prepared to go back through, the, through I saw a light deep in the passage. Joe? I called out, nothing. Joe? Still no answer. The light got brighter and I could hear the noise of someone crawling across the broken rock that lined the cave. You okay, Joe? No, was his weak reply. When he got to the other side of the tomb, he said he was not feeling well. He quickly took his gear off and put them in the bag so we could pull it through. As I pulled the bag through the passage, he began to climb back through the tomb. We didn't even get a chance to question him about what he saw before he was coming back through. He quickly slipped through the squeeze in the, in the hole and we finally got a look at him. He looked terrible. His face was pale and he was out of breath. The dust that covers the floor of the squeeze left his, its mark on his face and clothes. He had numerous small cuts and scratches all on his face and arms, probably from the rapid exit of the passage. His eyes were open wide. We only had a brief moment to look at the, cha at the change that had occurred to Joe before he started to head up and out of the cave without saying a word. While Joe and B started for the surface, I took a minute to gather out gear. Then I stopped and listened into the passage. I heard nothing, and I felt nothing. The wind had stopped. Part of me wanted to get out of the cave as fast as possible, but another part of me wanted to immediately climb back through the passage to find out what made this cave tick. Then was not the time, though. I still felt a little dizzy from my injury. At that moment, I noticed B and Joe had made good time getting up the cave passage, and I was left alone. Chills ran through my body as I scurried to catch up with them. Once we got outside the cave, I figured we would be able to find out more from Joe. 
but when we got up to the final climb, he just unclipped from the rope and went straight to the truck. In the light of day, he looked even worse than in the cave. B and I gathered up the rope and our gear and headed for the truck. Joe said he did not want to stay overnight because he felt terrible. So we headed home. We could get no information from Joe. He just start, stared straight ahead. He was shaking like a leaf, and he said he was not cold. When we tried to question him, his answers were short. I asked him if he saw the hieroglyphics. No. Did she hear us yelling? No. Did you see it around rock? No. Did you see the crystals? No. He said he just went a little ways in and started to feel sick. Something was fishy about his answers. He would have had to see to have seen the crystals if he got far enough into the cave, then he couldn't hear us yelling. But why would he not elaborate? The rest of the trip passed in eerie silence. Joe didn't say much else. He gave him a brief outline of the strange events that happened in the cave. He didn't reply. As we were dropping him off, we asked if he wanted to go back in the cave. He shook his head and ran into his house. I tried to call him later in the day, in the next day, but only got his voicemail. April 28th, 2001 In his journal entry, I discussed briefly the feelings B and I ha had at this point. I would like to elaborate on those feelings and set the mood for this part of my journal. I hope I can successfully convey our exact thoughts and feelings as we contemplated our next move. If not, I'm afraid we will appear to the average reader as being ignorant, naive, or downright foolish. This passage presented to us a culmination of weeks of hard work, complete with an array of emotions, from fatigue to fear, anticipation to pain, from frustration to glory. To us, we are not standing on the brink of possible destruction, but rather honoring an unspoken commitment, such like a parent of a wayward child. We are not about to abandon our child out of fear of the unknown. Like it or not, this cave had become a part of us, and now we must see this adventure to its fruition. Additionally, verbose explanations aside, we are being eaten alive with curiosity. Despite the overwhelming number of unexplained occurrences, we experienced we had to go back into this cave. What was making the rumbling noise? What caused the change in wind strength? Etc. Etc. All the way down to Joe. What could have possibly happened to him? What did he see or experience? We had many lengthy discussions about what our next move would be. We kept coming to the same conclusion. We had to return to the cave. We could offer no possible scenarios that would solve the many riddles held deep within the cave. The only way we could hope to complete the puzzle would be, would be to conquer the cave. We are going back to the mystery cave. Two weeks after our trip with Joe, and we are on our way back to the cave to prepare for this trip. We con contacted the local cave rescue group and got permission to borrow their low voltage two way phone. The phone consists of two transceivers and a long spool of thin wire. I would be, I would then be able to unwind the wire as I went through the passage and stay in contact with B the entire time. We also thought it would be a good idea to take a video camera into the new passage. I purchased a, a case that would be that would protect my video camera from dust as well as sharp rocks. I was more than willing to pay the cost of the case just to make sure B got to see the entire passage. My head was doing fine. I still had a light red line to mark the spot where I tried to break the rock with my head. I never went to the doctor, but it was a very painful experience. 
I have thought about what would have happened if I had been able to go to the passage with Joe. He was a changed man after he came out. I've been calling his house nearly every day trying to talk to him, but he won't answer his phone. B called his work and a mutual friend told him that Joe called in sick two weeks ago and hasn't been in since. He said Joe warned his boss he might be out for a while. I even stopped by his house twice. The first time it looked like someone was home, but no one answered the door. Second time his car was gone and there was no lights on. I hoped to talk to him before this trip, but it didn't work out. As we were rigging up the rope to descend into the cave, I felt something for the first time. I did not want to go into the cave. It was not a feeling of foreboding. I was not receiving some promotion. promotion. I, w I just had no desire to enter the underground world of Mystery Cave. I didn't share this feeling with B at the time. Even though I had no desire to go into the cave, I knew we had to. So I double checked my gear and slipped over the edge of the kit cliff. Right from the beginning, it seemed like the cave did not want us to be there. Nothing went smoothly. Every time we tried to clip a carpenter or tie a knot or attach something to the rope, we had to do it two or three times to get it right. Fortunately, we recognized this and made sure everything was safe and secure. As we slowly made our way down, we were continually bumping into the side of the cave or stumbling as we walked or dropping things. We finally reached a point where we stopped to gather ourselves before continuing. Our load was relatively light, but we were talking, but we were taking forever to get to the hole. Finally, we made it. We checked the camera and phone to make sure they survived the trip. We tested everything and I gathered the gear and wanted to take into the passage. Then it was time. We looked at each other but said nothing. I turned to face the passage as I twisted my body and began entering the tomb. I desperately hoped it would be the last time I would contort, contort my body to enter this claustrophobe's nightmare. The trip through Floyd's tomb went smoothly, figuratively speaking. After I got through, we took several minutes to get everything passed through to me. I got suited up and tested all the equipment. The phone worked like a charm. I videotaped the squeeze and then the first section of the new passage. Since I would be unable to tape while I crawled, my plan was to crawl to the next section and then stop to film some more. I should feel what I had been through and then the video what I was going to crawl through next. That way, I could get each section from both ends. I was starting to feel pretty good about the trip. I felt a sense of personal satisfaction at being able to provide a way for B to see the fruits of his, of his labor. It was awkward lugging the camera and unrolling the phone wire while trying to crawl. I knew it it would be worth it though. The small formations were too small to show up on the video. With normal outside lighting, it would be no problem. But with my headlight was the only source of light, the the light the A effort was futile. The crystal formations turned out quite nice. They were they were easily large enough to and made for some pretty good footage. Took advantage of the film and stopped to check their phone. It was comforting to hear someone's voice deep within the passage. We chatted briefly, then I unplugged the phone and prepared to continue. The phone resembled an oversized regular phone, more like the ones you would see in war movies. When I wanted to talk to, to B, I would just plug the phone into a special jack on the spool of wire. The power source was on B's end of the phone, so it was always turned on. The reception was as clear as a normal phone. I continued forward. Even through progress was slow, it was steady. Things were going pretty good until I reached the round rock. Once again, I got a strange feeling, just like the last time. 
I looked around carefully but saw nothing to be alarmed about. I proceeded to film the entire room. I got good shots of the round rock from all angles. I got the walls, ceiling, and floor to be to my best of my ability. I even got some pretty good tape of the figure on the wall. It was difficult to make out exactly what it was on the video, but you could definitely tell something was there. After I taped everything to my satisfaction, I moved toward the end of the room to prepare to explore new territory. At the far end of the large room was the passage that led to darkness. The entrance was about a foot lower than my head, and it looked like it continued at the height for as far back as I could see. I ducked under the ceiling prepared to see new sights. The walls of the new passage were darker than the rest of the cave to this point. The floor was made up of the same rock, same type of broken rocks. The ceiling had the same type of near perfect arch as an old section of Mystery Cave. It almost seemed out of place in the jagged atmosphere of, of a cave. I would only see back about 30 feet or so where the passage appeared to make a right hand turn. I thought this would be a good place to check in with B. It took a couple of beeps before he answered the phone, but once he did, his voice was still crystal clear. He sounded like he might have been snoozing. He said he was doing fine, that I could take as much time as I needed. I thanked him and hung up. His patience had been wonderful during the whole project. He spent a lot of time just waiting for me while I explored a passage. I was glad he was still willing to sit and wait. I hung up the phone and started to film the new passage. Then it happened. From behind me, I heard the scraping noise. It was loud. It was close. It was coming from the large room I had just left. I wheeled around to face whatever had made the noise. Then I did. When I did, I lost my presence of mind and stood up at the same time. Crunch. My helmet smashed into the passive ceiling. My light broke and I was buried in heavy darkness. Pain shot through my neck and down into my back. The helmet had protected my head, but my neck was nearly numb from the impact. Fear enveloped me and my knees began to weaken. I slowly and involuntarily slumped into my knees. I gently set the camera down and as I began to see the stars from the pain in my upper back. The scraping noise lasted only a second and now the only sound I could hear was my own panic inspired breathing. Not only could I feel, feel the fear thick upon my chest, but the darkness seemed to hold me in place. I felt like I was vulnerable from every direction. I wanted to turn to look behind me, into the side of me and in front of me. Everywhere I looked, I saw black. Finally, I broke the stupor of terror, terror long enough, long enough to reach an alternative light source. The mini mag on my helmet. I twisted the light to turn it on, and when I did, I nearly cried. I had forgotten to put fresh batteries in, and now I could barely see more than a few feet. Still, it was better than nothing. I immediately began shining the light with all my might into the large room. I strained to get a glimpse of any movement in the room. Nothing. I was shaking violently as I sat there trying to figure out what to do. My mind was not thinking clearly. I honestly thought I was going to die right there in the cave. For a fleeting moment, I wonder how B would ever figure out what happened to me. Then it hit me like a boulder. The phone. My mind must have been clearing up at the up that point because I also thought about my glow sticks. Without taking my eyes off the large room, I felt around, around my pack for the glow sticks since I was carrying the phone. And video camera, I removed as much as possible from my pack, and one of the things I left with B was my backup headlamp. Thus, I was left with only the glow sticks.
I found one and ripped it out of the package. I could tell something was wrong by how it sounded. It, is, it has been inadvertently broken and now, and was now useless. I chucked it on the ground and searched my pack for another one. I looked, took my eyes off the large room only to check the passage behind me occasionally. Found another glow stick, broke it and to light it up. Soft green glow created eerie colors on the walls of the cave. The stick provided barely enough light to see an immediate area, provided no hint of what lay ahead. I felt the pack for one more light, again without taking my eyes off the room. I felt a third glow stick and ripped it out of the package. After breaking it to make sure it, it worked, I hesitated, then, thro then threw the glow stick into the large room. Throw was a perfect one, and the stick sailed through the length of the of the room. In a brief moment that the light traveled through the room, I saw nothing but cave walls. The absence of anything unusual did nothing to ease my state of panic. At the far end of the room, I got a brief glimpse of that round rock as the light bounced on it. Then the light went behind the rock, and it seemed to disappear. I was still shaking, but at least I didn't see anything. Still, there was the noise. I used the glow stick to light the phone real quick, and with fumbling fingers, I managed to plug my phone into the jack. I put my phone to my ear and heard nothing. The usual beefs to indicate the connection with the other phone were not there. Terrified, I pulled the phone from the jack and reinserted it. Again, silence. The line was dead. It could have happened. I just talked to B. I found myself nearly sobbing with fear. I knew the only way out of here was back the way I came, but something was there. A third attempt at making contact with B met with the same results. I tried to think of another plan, but I could only focus on the memories of the grinding sound that I had heard. In my weakened state, I slumped against the side of the passage, breathing as if I had just finished a race, never bre breaking eye contact with the shadows of the large room. As my shoulder touched the wall, I had a powerful jolt of pain reminded me of my collision with the roof of the cave. Despair, agony, terror. I can't say how exactly how long I sat there, but my feet were were tingling and my knees were gone. The pain in my back crept lower, although my neck felt no different. I resolved to make an attempt to exit the evil passage. I knew if I waited too long, I would lose what little light I had. I attempted to stand, but did not have the strength. I crawled slowly to the near end of the large room, dragging my pack beside me. Using the walls of the cave, I was able to slowly stand, though not straight, due to my sore back. Still breathing rapidly, I slowly advanced through the room. I wound up the phone wires I went. Eyes were staring straight ahead, straining for any signs of movement. With every step, my light would cast ever-changing shadows on the wall, keeping me busy trying to look at every one. Eyes burned as I realized I had not blinked for many minutes. How many? How long has this been going on? The sounds I could hear were the crunch of my feet on the broken rock and the wheezing of my breath. As I wound the cord, I could hear the squeak of the wheel, with each turn bringing me closer to the tomb, closer to B, closer to safety. The short trip through the room took an eternity as I passed the crew drawing. It seemed to glow, as if offering some sort of warning. I didn't know what the drawing represented, but everything about this cave seemed to instill fear. Toward the far end of the room, I could see the round rock dimly. At the far reaches of my light, something seemed different about it, but I couldn't tell what when I got Within a few feet, I could tell what had changed. It had moved. That was the sound I heard. Again, terror gripped my entire body as I realized how close I was to something. 
I had no choice but to continue. Still, it was not easy. I inched toward the rock holding both stick ahead of me, and, and my shaking hand used it as a used it to pierce the darkness. I stopped just to slide just just as I stopped just the side of the rock and wound up the slack of foam wire. Then I realized why I had lost contact with B. The rock was now sitting on the wire. I gave it a tug, and the thin wire snapped. My only hope of contact with the outside world ceased to exist when that wire broke. I had never felt so alone and helpless, buried deep within the earth. I voluntarily descended into my own grave with a casket of soiled rock. With the phone now useless, I set it down in the passage. My gaze fixed on the round rock, I proceeded forward. My breathing was rapid, with my throat dry and aching, and my mouth dusty. With every crunch of the rock below my feet, my heart seemed to stop. No movement could be seen in the green glow of my stick. I got to the rock and peered over the top. Seeing nothing, I took several rapid steps past it. When I reached the other side, I recoiled in horror at what I saw. Inside of the passage near Fora was a hole, but with another passage revealed. It had been covered by the rock, but now it was exposed. The rock could not have moved by itself. Backed away from the hole and collided with the opposite wall. I had not been paying attention to the pain in my back, but now it came back to me in, a, in all of its fury. I stared down at newly discovered passage. It went down at a 45 degree angle and continued straight for as far as I could see. Several feet down, I could see the glow stick that I had thrown. It illuminated the passage enough that I could tell that the walls were fairly smooth. Or seemed to be the same way, unlike the rest of the cave. The passage was about three feet in diameter as far as I could see. It would have been easy passage to explore if I at least decided to do so. Right now, I wanted out of the cave and into daylight. I slowly backed away from the hole uh, toward B. I never took my eyes off the abyss. I nearly tripped over the phone wire as I turned to leave the Devil's Lair. I noticed my mini mag was practically dead, leaving me only with the glow stick. I wanted to sprint to Floyd's tomb, just hearing another human being would help alleviate some of the fear I was experiencing. As I turned away from the large rock in the hole, I felt an overwhelming sense of panic fill my soul. I felt like a legion of demons was about to attack me from behind. I felt like my salvation lie ahead of me in the darkness, and Lucifer was behind me, trying to keep me from safety. I found myself moving much faster than I should have been in that cave. My only thought was to get out as quickly as possible. I passed the crystal formation, barely even noticing this beautiful creation of nature and the green glow of my light. Every time I ducked to avoid a rock, I felt my back scream. It's a reminder of my injury. When I got to the point in the passage where I had to crawl, I flung myself down on all fours. <laughs> Barely slowing down as I dropped. When my hands came into contact with the cave floor, I felt in much shock. Shoot all the way down my back and simultaneously down my arms. For the first time since this nightmare had begun, I let out a scream. I crumbled down and lay there on the rock, new levels of pain manifesting. Every time I, I inhaled, whimpering from fear and pain, I tried to listen to any other noise in the cave. I could feel the silence pounding in my head. I knew from the previous trips that B was still out of earshot, but I was close. Forcing myself to move, I winced as I pulled my body onto all fours and started to process along the cave, or progress along the cave. I still held the glow stick in my hand, but I, I had ceased checking behind me. Now my focus was ahead of me. I reached a point where I could yell at be yell to be, but I didn't make a sound. I didn't want to stop long enough to talk. 
Finally, I've reached the last stretch of the cave before the squeeze. As I was crawling toward the beginning of the tomb, I called the bee. He answered back. I screamed to him to get everything ready to go. He asked if I was okay. I told him no. And to get everything ready to go. When I reached the rope, I flipped off my helmet and shoved it into my pack. For the first time, I realized that I had forgotten my video camera. It was a fleeting thought. I cared no more about that camera than a passenger. But the Titanic cared about a hat or a coat. I tied the pack of the rope and told him to pull it through. Then I told him to start heading back toward the surface as soon as he pulled the rope through. He asked why and I screamed that there was something in the cave with us. My back ached with every move I made. I knew it didn't matter though. I wasn't going to get through the tomb as fast as I could. Injuries notwithstanding. Just as I started into this squeeze, I felt the wind in the passage increase, and with it, with it, the most nauseating stench I have ever experienced. It smelled like damp, rotting, rancid, putrid death. I almost started to dry heave. I pulled my shirt up over my nose to shield me from the overpowering smell. At this point, B smelled it too, and he yelled, What is that? Then he yelled at me to hurry up and get through. I told him I was coming. Then I took a deep breath through my shirt and start, started back through. B's yelling had intensified my fear and panic as if I needed any help. I knew he could sense the urgency of getting out of this place. Still, as, as I worked my way through, I yelled at him to start up. Then I would catch up with him when I got through. That he would. He placed my glow stick inside the passage, then began to climb out. This time through the squeeze, I had no regard for the tightness of the passage. I was scraping my face, ears, arms, and shoulders. Every inch of the squeeze meant numerous scratches on my body, but I barely noticed them. My back was nearly paralyzing me with pain. Once again, I felt the rising need to vomit because of the odor being delivered to my nostrils by the breeze. Halfway through Floyd's tomb, I took a break to catch my breath. I was approaching exhaustion and my respiration rate was through the roof. The top of the passage seemed to rest my cheek and the floor felt like broken glass on my opposite cheek. As I pushed briefly to recuperate, I heard the scraping noise coming from deep within the cave. It continued for several seconds in silence. I let out a cry which startled me. I was no longer consciously reacting to the noise. The cry was a sub subconscious response to the fear which flowed through my entire body. In a panic, I began to scoot through the passage. As I reached the largest part of the tomb, I quickly slid my arms under my body to get into position to exit through our hole. I grabbed the rope and pulled it with all my might. My shoulders reached out the hole they lodged and it was stuck. I dug my feet into the rocks and wriggled my way back into the passage. Then turned my body slightly and tried again. This time I was successful and pulled my upper body through. Normally I would have carefully worked my way out since there was a three foot drop on the outside of the hole. This time I kicked with my legs and pulled with my arms and plop. I dropped out of the tomb right onto my shoulder. I tried to roll to soften the impact, but was unable to do anything more than take the blow. Strangely, the pain was focused on my shoulder, apparently not affecting my already sore back. I rolled over onto all fours, then slowly rose to my feet. The smell was much less intense outside of the passage. I grabbed the glow stick and used it to find my helmet. I began to the head for the webbing to climb up while strapping on, on my helmet. When I got to the webbing, I reached up to grab hold and recoiled in horror. In the glow of the glow stick, I could see for the first time the injuries to my arms. My forearms were covered with deep cuts and scrapes. Much of my arm was covered with blood. The wounds are not deep enough to bleed freely, but rather ooze the blood. In the brief moment that I had stopped, I noticed that there was silence in the cave, no sounds coming from the passage. 
and nothing from up ahead. Once again, the feeling of being alone returned, motivating me to proceed. Climbing up the little drop off proved to be difficult in my condition. Having the glow stick as the only light source added to the challenge. Once on top, I scrambled to catch up with B. I was impressed with the speed of his ascent. Although I did not mention any more of my physical condition during my exit, I was hurting. With every step I took, pain shot through my lower back and my neck. My arms were shredded and my shoulder had a nice gash in it. I also believe that, that if it were not for the terror I felt at the time, I would not have the energy and motivation to climb out. I was running on pure adrenaline. Unfortunately, the adrenaline surge was about to end. I did not see or hear B until I reached a small area at the bottom of the drop. He was on the rope and climbing out as fast as he could. I could hear him moving quickly and breathing heavily. I called out to him and his startled reaction told me he was nearly as tense as I was. He told me to get on the rope and start climbing. We both knew that we would be that would be dangerous and not something we would ever or normally do. But this was different. I stood there looking up and where the rope disappeared into the darkness above me. It danced around as, as B made his way to safety. He was out of sight, but I knew he was close. I knew the rope was my lifeline to the outside, to light safety. Behind me was the darkness, fear, the unknown. I had the fleeting thought of a movie scene where the actor had outwitted the monster and had reached the front door to the haunted house. Just as he reaches for the knob, he hears the sound behind him and turns and only to see. I slid the glow stick into the cord of my helmet and reached for my harness. Then I thought I would let B get a little bit higher Then, while I pulled the rope that was stretched down into the cave. That would make it easier to get out once we got, got to the top of the drop. I chose not to wind the rope around my arm since it was sore and bleeding, so I just pulled it into a pile on the floor from above. I heard B warn me, rock, and I ducked under the ledge as several small rocks landed on the floor near my feet. I quickly went back to pulling the rope in. I was about halfway in, about 50 feet when the rope hit a snag. Ugh, it was solid. There was no way I was going to crawl back in to release it. So I decided to just forget the rope and get my harness on and get back, get out of the cave. I quickly threw the harness around me and started to buckle it. But before I secured it, I heard a strange noise at my feet. My pulse began to quicken. I looked down at the, at the rope only to discover to my horror that the rope was disappearing down into the darkness. Something was pulling the rope back into the cave. Let go of the harness and began clawing my way up the rope. The unbuckled harness fell to the floor. Unfortunately, I held on to the ascender. At that moment, I could, could not think straight and began climbing out of the cave without being attached to the rope. I climbed out many times without using an ascending device, but I was always attached to the rope just in case. I was climbing as fast as, as my battered body would hold me up. I was in a near panic state again and consequently was scraping, bumping, and gouging my arms and legs. As I climbed, I screamed to B that something was pulling the rope. He yelled back to hurry up. Luck was with me in that, that I didn't slip and fall back down into the hole. If I had, I would have bounced several times against the sides of the cave before smashing into the floor. The injuries would be fatal. Without the necessity of having to stop the slide, the, the ascender up the rope, I have made an excellent time getting up. I could see rays of light above me coming from the entrance to the cave. To the cave, that told me exactly where I was in the cave. I caught up with B on a ledge below, where. Our rebay lay point was fixed. I told him to keep going. 
it would only take him a few minutes, but every second would be torture because I would have to wait for him to get up and watch the rope that he had that we had just climbed up. I expected to see some creature from deep within the earth climb up and make me its lunch. The rope moved around a bit in rhythm with bees climbing, but did not appear to have any tension on it. As I stood there waiting for B, I kept watching the rope for signs of anything bizarre. I didn't know if it was my heart could take any more stress. I could not have been more weird. I tried to relax a bit to make sure I was thinking rationally, but my poor brain had reached sensory overload. As B, as B reached the top of the last climb, I got ready to clip on my cinder and get my sorry butt out of here. It was then that I noticed that the rope began to tighten from below. I could feel the tension on the rope, but it was a steady tension. Not like someone was climbing up either way. I wanted out of there as fast as possible. I slipped on and scrambled up the rope. I hadn't noticed, but B had kept on moving toward the entrance. I got up to the last feet in a hurry. I just unclipped and kept on moving, leaving the rope behind. By the time I got to the entrance of the cave, in daylight, B was almost up to where the rope was anchored. I wanted to get up so bad, I almost started a free climb without clipping onto the rope. I could see B was almost up, so I clipped on and started up. I almost didn't make it up. I had just started up when I nearly collapsed from exhaustion. I managed to recover enough to pull myself up the last few feet. As I climbed, I could hear the tension on the rope manifest itself by the stretching noise in the rope. I prayed that the rope would not break with me attached to it. The second that I reached the top, I unclipped the ascender. I could see B kneeling down by the tree. So I limped over to him and collapsed. For the first time since I went through Floyd's tomb, we could see each other. We just stared. I knew I looked pretty bad. But I didn't know that B was in such bad shape. He had cuts and scrapes on every exposed surface of his body. His face was pale, almost white. His mouth and eyes were wide open. He was breathing heavily, almost gasping. The shock we sh shared at the other person's appearance was broken. When we heard the rope around the tree stretch and the knot B had tight, tied tighten, I was frozen in place, overwhelmed with fright. B seemed to be trifixed on the knot. Then, in one motion, he produced a pocket knife and began to work on the rope. It is amazing how a person's state of mind can alter the perception of time. I'm sure it only took four or five seconds to, to sever the rope from the tree, but it seemed like an hour. When the rope was cut, the knot fell to the ground while the end of the rope sipped across the rocks and over the edge of the cliff, with the, the speed of it causing a humming noise as it went. As soon as the rope was cut, V let out a cry. He dropped the knife and fell backward. Watching the rope fly over the edge brought the feelings in the passage back to me. I got up and headed towards the truck. I noticed V was still lying there, wide-eyed, staring at the point. The rope disappeared. I called to him, which seemed to break his trance. He got up and hurried away from the tree, the cave, the nightmare. Neither of us said a word all the way home. It's now four days after our trip to the cave. It has taken me four days and dozens of attempts to get this entire experience written into my journal. Every time I started to write, I recall the terrible feelings I had and I couldn't write anymore. I felt compelled to continue so as to document the unbelievable events. While all the details were fresh in my mind, I can still feel the pain. St still smell the f stench. Still experience the terror. Even typing from my own journal has taken hours. I would have 
I would like to write more, but it will have to wait. Even now, several days between me and the event, I can't relax. I can barely concentrate. That's all for now. May 19th, May 19th, 2001. It has been three weeks since our last visit to the cave. I want to update everyone as to my condition, my plans for the cave, and events of the past few weeks. I apologize for not returning your call phone calls. I have been getting all of your messages. I just haven't felt up to calling back. Steve, Mark, thanks for your words of encouragement on my answering machine. I know you two are sincerely concerning for me. You are awesome friends, Mark. I know you stopped by the house a few times, and I'm sorry I never answered the door. I really, It really helped me just knowing you dropped by. Sis, I can hear you. Hear the worry in your voice. I'm okay. Don't worry about me. Just take care of the of those niece and nephews of mine. I figure if I can't get this site updated, I can let everyone know at once about how I am doing. A lot has happened in the last three weeks, so I'll do my best to cover everything. I guess I should start where the last entry left off. It took several days to get the last journal entry written down. I was so shaken up from the experience that I could do little else but sit around and ponder what had happened. Right now, I am on long-term medical leave from work. I tried to go to work several days after the event, but my boss sent me home. I couldn't concentrate and looked terrible. I've even been to the doctor, but I couldn't tell him about the experience, so I just told him I was under a lot of stress. He recommended me rest and gave me a pres pres prescription to help me relax. Mm, good drugs. When I left the cave, I was nearly in a state of shock. I could not think clearly and was having a difficult time of trying to understand what had happened. I didn't eat much, nor did I get any sleep. I was glad I had the presence of mind to write down my experiences while I was fresh in my mind. As I reread what I wrote, I felt like I accurately portrayed what happened in the cave that day. I wouldn't change anything I wrote. Even though it took me three days to write it, when I finished writing it in my journal, I feel much better. I guess it was kind of therapeutic. Unfortunately, it didn't last. In fact, it was after... Then, that things got really bad. B and I parted company after the trip and didn't see him again until yesterday. I didn't try to reach him and he didn't try to get a hold of me. Nor did either of us try to contact Joe. B just dropped me off after the trip and I spent the next several days by myself in my house. I tried to eat but had no appetite. I was restless but I couldn't find it. Anything to do to take my mind off the experience. That's when I determined that I should write it down. As I mentioned, that helped me think a little clearer. And I seemed to be a little calmer. But it didn't last. I went to work the next day, but was sent home. The day after, I had an overwhelming feeling of anxiety sink into my soul. I was depressed and confused and had no one I wanted to turn to for comfort. I was getting all kinds of phone calls from people, but I was just letting the answering machine take the calls. I even changed the message on, on the machine to let everyone know I was alright. I continued in a miserable state, eating and sleeping whatever I could manage until a week after the trip. Then things started to get strange. At first, I was hearing sounds in the house that had no explanation. Footsteps, shuffling noises, creaking doors. You know, a typical horror movie fair, only the sounds were not distinct. It was as though I wasn't sure I heard what I thought I heard. I would be eating or getting out of the shower and stop thinking I heard something. But the sound would not repeat itself. In fact, if it weren't for the fact that it happened frequently, I couldn't be sure there were noises in the first place. Either way, I was scared. 
It was as though I had been caught in a spider web for the last week. A feeling of anxiety, foreboding, and tension filled my life. Then came the hallucinations. I began seeing things in a manner similar to the sounds I was hearing, just a glimpse of something in the corner of my eye. When I tur would turn to look at look, nothing, I had been sleeping with the lights on in my room, but nothing that kept all the lights on. But I kept all the lights in the house on from before dusk to after dawn. When I started seeing things on a regular basis, I purchased a gun. Got it from an ad in the paper so I didn't have to wait for the, for a permit. I went to the door, doctor but didn't mention the details of my life. Just told him I couldn't relax. And I walked out there with, with, with a prescription. Fortunately, my wounds and injuries were pretty much healed by this time. My back was hurt a little, but the prescription took care of that too. When I was on, on the medication, I felt great, but I didn't want to walk around high the rest of my life. So I would take it out on the end of the tough day. Unfortunately, the severity of sinus de increasing, giving rise to a need for my medication. The flashes in the corner of my eye continued, but then I began to see shapes and shadows. They would be outside my windows, usually at night. I still couldn't make out anything solid, so it was hard to pin down what I was seeing. Soon I began to close all of the, my drapes and binds so I could remove the possibilities of seeing something. Doing so did help in that respect, but my life was still a mess. My daily routine was mechanical and empty. I would sleep in as long as I could, usually out of exhaustion. Then I would get cleaned up and try to eat something. I lost a lot of weight, so I tried to get as much as possible down me. Then I would exercise a little and nap a lot. I'd only been out of the house a few times in the last two weeks. The store, the doctor, the gun purchase. I didn't watch too much TV because I couldn't concentrate. I spent a lot of time on the internet. I was doing research on caves and cave myths. The only story I could find was the cave or folklore of the hog, hog dad, a uh, hodad. The hodad is supposedly a creature that roams caves. Two weeks after I went into the cave, and a week after I began hearing things, I began to have nightmares. Extremely lucid nightmares. No specific theme or recurring events. Just plain terrifying. Sometimes I was in my house and someone was trying to get to me. Only I couldn't run because I had no legs. Other times I was a, I was in a vat and someone was pouring a syrup-like liquid on me, filling the vat. I would wake up in a panic. I would stay awake until exhaustion forced me to enter dreamland once and more, once again. The brutal routine it continued for several days until it. It reached a climax on the sixth day. My dreams seemed so real I had a hard time telling if I was awake or not. I was I was beat, really drained of energy and spirit. I was going from the living room to my bedroom in the early morning when I looked down the hall and saw a dark figure toward the end. I thought it was a thief and began to back up slowly. It didn't move. As I was backing up, the lights flickered off and on. Every muscle was tense. I stopped to stare at the figure. Just then the phone rang. It startled, startled me so bad I stumbled over to the chair. When I got up, I wheeled around, looked down the hall, and nothing was there. I grabbed my keys and left the house. I felt compelled to get in the car and drive. My pulse pounded in my temples as I got in and started the car. I wanted to drive to Overlook Point and see the city lights. I didn't know why I needed to go there, but I knew I had to go. And the closer I got, the more urgent the feeling. When I arrived at that 
at the point I saw something that first startled me, but then caused me to be more relaxed than I had been in a long time. Joe was there. He was out of his car standing, looking at the lights. He looked. We looked at each other. I could see from the tired look on his face. He had been going through the same miserable trial that I had been experiencing. You could tell from from the look on my face that we had shared the same terrible experience. Our conversation was unbelievably brief. You've been back, he began, even though he knew the answer. Yes. You need to return. Tomorrow good? I asked. Yeah, noon. He got in his car, and I got into mine. I hadn't even wanted to talk to him about his experience, obviously. He didn't want to know mine. I drove over to B's house. When he answered the door, I thought that B actually looked like he was doing fine, somewhat happy. One look at me, his suspicion changed. Our conversation was also suspicion. I ran up to Joe. We're going back in tomorrow at noon. He looked dead serious. He just nodded his head. I asked him if he could spend the night. If I could spend the night in his house, he irritably let me in. I didn't notice until later, but every light in the house was turned on. He led me to a spare room. Help yourself. Thanks. I washed up in the bathroom, took some medication, and got the first decent sleep in a long time. I woke early this morning and came home to get ready for the trip. I thought I would spend out this update so no one would wonder what was going on with me. I suspect that by the time most of you read this, I'll be back home and I'll have a great story to tell. I promise that if you haven't heard from me by now, you'll you'll shortly. It is now 10 a.m. on Saturday the 19th. We will be leaving for a ca the cave in two hours. Preparing for this trip will be like no other trip I have been on. For the first time in my life, I'll carry a gun into the cave. I'll also carry a knife, an extensive first aid kit, plenty of food and water, and a camera. I'll take several sources of light and a pad, paper, and pencil. I'll take, I will take all of my climbing ropes and be lost. Is in the cave. I'll carry a good. I have the rope with me on the other side of Floyd's tomb. There are so many things I hope to accomplish this day. So many answers I hope to find in a tiny passage hidden from view. Reflecting on the events leading up to today leaves me feeling dizzy. Was this all a bad dream? Unfortunately, I am wide awake. And still, in a few short hours, I might face my nightmare. The thought of having another person with me in the passage does nothing to alleviate the fear I feel. I almost chuckle as I ponder a childish notion that we will have to, to consider who will enter the tomb first, who will lead the way into the dark unknown, who will decide when to turn back. Foremost among the questions in my mind is, what about the video camera that I left behind? It is supposed to be able to record in complete darkness. I left the thing running, so... What might we find on the tape? Darker questions follow. What if the camera is gone? What if it is destroyed? Although it's difficult to put an exact name on my motivation, I think closure fits quite nicely. I need to find out a few things about this cave. The main thing I believe it or not is to find the end of the cave with all the bizarre things I have witnessed these past few weeks. It would seem a a bit trite to want as a primary goal to get to the end, but that is what I want. To be sure, I will be seeking other bits of knowledge along the way. If, however, I find the end of the main passage into an end to the passage hidden by the rock, I will be content to never return to the passage of the cave again. Never. It would seem to me that crawling head first through the tight passage into the darkness is an unnatural thing, just like crawling up the side of the cliff for recreation, or jumping out of the perfectly good airplane and floating to the ground. 
We do these things to satisfy our hunger for adventure, this subconscious desire to conquer our own little Everest, as B is fond of saying, caving is the last opportunity for exploration for the person with the modest means. True, just a short di drive from just about everywhere in the con country is a cave waiting to be explored. Even a cave well known among the general public can be approached by someone for the first time as an adventure, something new, something to overcome, because it's there. I mean, if you don't agree with my decision to pursue this cave, I know this from the messages I've received. I'm afraid I don't have a choice. If I am ever to experience restful slumber, I must return. If I ever walk the halls of my own home in peace, I must return. If I am ever to exit the overworld and enter the subterranean world of a cave, I must now return. I no longer feel that I have, an, I have a choice. I must return. For my family and friends who are reading this, I must, I say, be at peace. I will conquer this cave. Then I will return and update this website immediately. I will include any photos we take in the cave today. And if you stop by the house, I will show you the video I, I will have. I expect to be home later tonight or tomorrow at, at the latest. See you all soon with lots of answers. Love, Ted. And that's it. Does that mean they die? They never come back? I don't know. But Jesus Christ, I think that was longer than 86 minutes. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that was way longer than 86 minutes, because we started around 10-something, it's 125. Well, I think and, and, last... oh. and it was 86 minutes, that would be accurate, because... So, 60 minutes. Wait, wouldn't that mean it would be shorter, since you took like 10 to 15 minutes in the middle? Well, actually... No, because it sounds like it was three hours, and 80 oh, is shorter than three hours. Yeah. Oh, wait. In fact, two hours would be 120 minutes. Yeah. So, way past the length that it said it would be. Yeah, Jesus Christ. I was thinking about it in my own time. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair, Donna. Get rid of Ted the Caver. Alright. And now that that story's gone, or not gone, done, I need to go pee really badly. Okay. I think I've needed two for over an hour. That's fair. But before you go, Jerry, uh, now we can wait till you get back. Never mind. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll be right back. Or try to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ooh, that was a really long story and good read. All right, I will book. Ah, what the fuck. Is it normal to get ringing in one of your ears at random? Uh. 
I get ringing in my ears sometimes. Okay. Could be a tinnitus. I hope not. Because I already have problems with my ears for my twos are too small. Hmm. So I hope it's not tinnitus. And it's not, and it's like very rarely happens. Like maybe like once a month or so. It doesn't mean it's not fucking annoying. I think I'm just going to read one more story. But I don't have it mm -hmm. put to a vote as what story I'll read. It'll be a three minute poll, but I'll wait for Jerry to get back to post it. Oh. Hmm. While we're waiting for Cherry, you know how my car was totaled, right? Cherry is not here. Yeah, I know. I said, like while we're waiting for Cherry, that you know how my car's not totaled. Uh, you know how my car, car is totaled, right? Because of the incident. Mm hmm So, uh, insurance came by and said, basically, your car is worth five hundred dollars. My what? Five hundred dollars. Oh jeez, that's not a lot. Yeah. However, give me a moment. I do have a picture of a car I'm waiting for it to get back in stock to get. So just give me a moment. I can send it out. Let me see what you think of the car. See right there. And of course, you're right there. Oh yeah, because I can't even see Borkworm's messages because of the poll thing. I can hear Jerry in the distance. 
like a good car. Huh? Looks like a good car. Probably gonna be. Probably gonna be expensive somewhat. Yeah. From what the cars I was looking at to what I would like, most of them were like thirty to thirty-five grand. The one I just sent the both of you uh, is twenty-one grand. Hmm. Which is way better, and it's also brand new. I mean, no owners. Which is a lot better than 35 grand or 30 grand. Very bright. Yeah. You have a way of getting to your work? Yeah. Like a bike or something? Um, uh, no. Uh, it's you someone picks uh, pick me up, and then we go. I, okay. forgot, I forgot what that's called. Carpool. Um. Yeah, carpool. Okay. Now this is making me want to pee. Just talking about. <laughs> About stuff while waiting for Chiri to come back from peeing. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna send this picture of the car to Hatchet and give no explanation as to why. I might be able to pick something up. <laughs> Anyways, I'll be back. <laughs> Hey, Hatch. <clears throat> is, is Bright here? I think she might have went to go pee. Oh, okay. Because, uh, is stream still going? Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Bright just sent me a single stock photo image of a Nissan. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I was that's... wanting clarification as to why I was just sent a photo of some random car. Oh, that's a car she want. She is thinking about like replacing her demolished one. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes sense. I guess she like she literally sent me with no context. It's just the car. It's just the picture of a car. Yeah, she told me you she would do that. Uh, anyway, how are y'all? Good, how are you? I'm feeling a bit better than I have been, but still kind of blah. Mm -hmm. Have you been resting or something? Yeah. Mostly just playing games and watching videos like normal. Ah, uh, okay. I guess that's the thing, like... It's probably would be better for me to do something other than play games while I'm feeling sick, but it's just become like such a major coping mechanism for me. Mm -hmm. It's like I don't know, I I don't know what else to do with myself when I'm feeling like mm -hmm. ass. Yeah, same. I'd say. Uh, my phone. Oh, hi. I'm back. And Hatchet's here. Yeah. Hey, I, I I hopped in to ask why Bright sent me a just no context picture of a car. What, that sounds weird. So, apparently a car she's planning to get at some point. 
but she just sent it to me without any context. <laughs> Sounds like bright in a nutshell. Yep. Yeah, it is. <laughs> And now, uh, and now I'm waiting for Bright to return so that I can say fuck you and then leave because my head hurts. <laughs> uh, how, how are you doing, Jerry? Well, I just finished listening to a story that was supposed to be under two hours but ended up three hours, so whoever wrote it was full of shit. Well, was it, mm -hmm. like, the story that Bright was reading? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the only break well, she, well. she took was to go to the bathroom. So she she went through a pretty fast for the size. Yeah, it was about, like, so her bathroom break was around 15, 15 to 30 minutes, I'd say. 30 minutes yeah, of the most. It's not like 30 minutes or anything. Though like 30 be, minutes at the most. Though no. to be fair, uh, people tend to read things faster in their head than out loud. That's a fair point. Mm -hmm. And plus they're an author, so they might be more used to reading things quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Where Bright has to read it slower than they would because they have to read it out loud. If you yeah. read things out loud too fast, people don't understand what you're saying. Yeah. Or she she makes three times as many um, pronunciation errors. Although, like with the at the at the very least, the the pronunciation errors are probably not going to slow her down as much as if it was in something else, because then we aren't going to immediately point out that she's being dingus. Mm -hmm. uh. Well, she made like tons of pronunciation errors when she was uh. reading it. I mean, yeah, that's pretty far for the course at this point. What um What's going on? I don't remember that one. What the fuck is happening? Oh, hi, Hatchet. <laughs> yeah, so... I'm so confused. What happened? <laughs> what? What about me? He sounds like me. Exactly. What? Because Booker said that something sounded like me. Maybe. Uh... Oh. Oh, it's because I I hopped in. To ask why it was sent a random image of a car. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Doing my... that without explanation is kind of par for the course of right. See, they they just agreed. <laughs> what did, did you just Taco Bell bright? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just clicking things. What? 
what I sent you was uh, a picture of my new car that I want to get when I come when they come back in, with, you know, like stock up. Yeah, that would take a lot of stocking up. Yeah. Um. The thing was, uh, I both if you two didn't hear it, but Derna and Bookworm did. Um, insurance came to tell me what my total car, uh, what my total car is, like, priced. You know, they give that money to you. Uh-huh. Yeah. $500. Ouch. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. So, when I was looking at cars, I saw that one. And, um... It, it the cars that I was mainly looking around at the time at the time was like thirty to thirty five thousand. Yeah. That one was twenty one thousand. I just sent you. Mm-hmm. Brand okay. new. Uh, with all a three sixty camera, heated seat, heated seats, and steering wheel. A connection to the car where you can connect your phone and play videos, uh, call, music, whatever. And a, a literal secret compartment in the back where you can hide groceries or gifts or anything. Keep people from stealing your shit. Uh, For twenty one grand, i will take that. That's... Yeah, but it's not out yet, so... Anyway, while you're we waiting, Jerry, we're gonna read one last story, then end stream. Wait, waiting for what? Oh, for you to come back from peeing. But when I was talking, when we were talking about it, I had... It made me feel the need to pee. It is, <sighs> uh, speaking of groceries... Potatoes! <clears throat> um... I just wanted to hop in to get context. I am not in a good headspace for socializing. When I get context. Yeah. Either way, uh, I guess thanks for the random image of a car. It, uh, it looks nice. I mean, it's a nice car. But, meh. Either way, have have a good night, y'all. Yeah, good night. All right, now the poll will start in three, two, one. <laughs> kind of not so secret since this car is mass produced. That's true. Yeah, the story is a suicide engineer, the conjurer, or a shattered life. And it seems someone already voted a shattered life. I'm only gonna vote once. Ah, uh, okay, that was you. <laughs> I feel like it wouldn't be fair to vote more than one. <laughs> so far, only one person voted. I assume bookworms eventually. <laughs> Bookworm, you can vote as much as you want. <laughs> I'm still deciding. Oh, someone else voted. Bookworm has yet to vote. <laughs> Yeah, I still did not expect that story to go way longer than it did. Is this Bookworm's version of deciding? <laughs> well, they voted each option equally. <laughs> no, I assume it was a Derna, says Bookworm. Oh, Bookworm did one vote. Oh, they haven't voted yet. <laughs> Look, where is it well, I only again? voted once, and you already know which one I voted for, so. Which means it's probably a Derna. 
Oh. Okay then. I think I know which one's winning. <laughs> or not. Looks like there's a fighting chance. I have no idea who is voting for what. <laughs> Do not mistake me for a conjurer of cheap tricks as book. <laughs> <laughs> Time's almost up, Bookworm. And the Conjurer is I have a the winner. Like that win. <laughs> 69. <laughs> well, it says the most person who contributed the most points was Aderna. Oh, Aderna. Yeah. I am surprised, but okay. <laughs> Is Aderna not allowed to do meme voting? All right, this one is a short one. It only lasts 15 minutes. All right. <clears throat> Shut up, bookworm. <laughs> the Conjurer. Twice in my life I wished for a magic wand. And the first was eight years into my marriage when our heart wrenching tender obstetrician told us there was nothing left to try. I never shared my husband's fascination with magic and conjuring tricks, but at that moment, hearing that news, I wished for a wand to magic up our longed for baby. Conjuring a missing piece of us, but there were no wands and there were was no magic there was nothing we could do everyone told us so when i felt pregnant out of the blue the following year i marveled over how such a miracle had occurred fate divine intervention planets aligning well david knew exactly where his faith lay i'm telling you mama bear he said, touching his fingertips to my belly. This gets magical. Fate, God, magic, I didn't care what he called it. I exulted in every terrifying moment of my glorious pregnancy. We had a healthy boy and named him Danny. As soon as he could hold a wand, our son wanted to be a magician. David brought him a magic set when he was three, and we played the captive audience to his one mini-man shows. As the years passed, even David couldn't work out how our boy pulled off some of the tricks he showed us. I joked it was the day Danny wanted to saw one of us in half that we need to worry. Everything about those first five years of Danny's life, our life as a family, was magical. If something has slithered onto my shoulder to whisper that, that my husband had only seven months to live, I would have laughed. So help me God, I would have laughed. But David collapsed one ordinary blue Sunday morning, and the future was shattered with a single word from the mouth of a stranger. Terminal was something you went through at the air at the airport. It couldn't have anything to do with the body of my husband. Danny was not even yet six. How, how do we tell him? I asked David as we stood brushing our teeth. First night we knew forever was fragmenting. How do we tell him you're going to leave us and it's forever? We stared into one another's eyes in the mirror as though the ghost in the glass might tell us what to do. In the end, David spoke to Danny on his own. 
Us boys are taking a walk, Mama Bear, he said, taking Danny by one hand. Guard the castle for us. I watched them walk out to the garden, the difference between their heights seizing my throat. That was the second time I wished for a wand to magic away the present horror and the future pain. But no spell caused the lumps that rose beneath David's skin. No enchantment lay waste to the body I cherished. I couldn't magic my husband better. I could only watch as the essence of him retreated and, and retreated from the windows of his eyes to a place where I couldn't follow. After David's death, unpredictable moments pulled me to my knees. A man passing who smelled like him, a voice speaking in similar cadences. Find such nothing moments my husband's absence reared up to sucker punch me in the gut. If I hadn't had Danny, I wouldn't have made it. My son became the bridge, connecting me from the other side of life to another over the gaping gulf of David's death. Danny carried me. Magic carried Danny. His dedication to practicing magic astounded me. At our library, physics, he chose only books about magic and conjuring. He'd spend hours watching TV shows of his favorite magician, who sported the pedestrian name of Mike. And I spent hours watching my son perfect new tricks. A few months after David's funeral, I passed by Danny's room with a load of washing and spotted him sitting, wand in hand, whispering to the photograph of David by his bed. What are you doing, Bob? I asked. Danny turned to me. I'm telling Danny about the trick I'm working on. It's a present for you. He said, pulling a photo to his chest in a simulation of embrace. I dabbed the corner of one eye with my shoulder and nudged through the door to walk over to my son and kiss his head. Daddy would want you to keep doing the things you love, darling. Whilst I worried about all the time Danny spent alone, I reasoned that children, like adults, need to deal with loss in their own ways, so I left him to it. I believed I was doing the right thing, but as the weeks ground by, and Danny's chats with his father's photographs showed no sign of waning. I felt some facts needed checking. Danny, you do know that, that Daddy died and went to heaven, don't you? Yes, Mama. And you know that heaven is such a nice place that no one who goes there wants to come back. Heaven can't be that nice for Daddy. We're not there. We'll go there one day and, and see him again. We just have to wait a while. I know. Mama? Yes, Danny? While we're waiting, you should get a boyfriend. One year passed, then two, then three. Danny settled into primary school and I went back to work in a in a different place, and a different kind of future stretched before us. A different kind of future required a different kind of man. I liked Joe for the things that made him unlike David. He believed in eating meals around a table with a TV off and giving logical answers to fanciful questions. Only when I've been seeing Joe for four months did I introduce him to Danny. As nervous as if arriving for a blind date, but my son had been chomping at the bit for me for to bring another man for our lives. He welcomed Joe into the house like all his Christmases had come at once. Joe knew nothing about magic or conjuring, and so Danny had a fresh and willing audience to show off his repertoire to. Sitting on the sofa, Joe and I watched Danny swirl his wand and, and swing his cape. It was almost the same. Almost. One evening, when we were alone in my bedroom after Danny was asleep, Joe stood by the bedside, rubbing the back of his neck. Stop me if I cross the line here, he said. 
Okay. I rearranged the duvet around me. I'm not sure about some of these books Danny reads. What about the book Danny reads? Don't you think? Cho sat on the edge of the bed and touched my hand. Some of them take the whole magic thing a bit too far. One looked a tad a goat to me. I slid my hand away. You think Harry Potter is a cult? It's having lessons to harness dark arts. What's not a cult about that? My eight-year-old son is not harassing, harnessing dark arts. I'm just saying. You don't get a say. You're not his. I stopped myself. But when Joe climbed into bed, he turned his back to me. I wouldn't apologize. I couldn't. I liked Joe. In time, I might love him. But he would never be Danny's father. I knew it. I knew it. Oh, wait. He knew it. I knew it. Danny knew it. Two weeks before the third anniversary of David's death, Danny came home from school effervescent and presented me with a letter. Mike the Conjurer was performing a show in a little theater in London, and Danny, along with 39 other children, were the competition winners invited to attend. I didn't know you entered a competition, darling, I said. We all had to do a magic trick in front of some teachers at school. That's what I was practicing all the time. You were telling me not, not. Oh, hold on, I gotta reread that. We all had to do a magic trick in front of some teachers at school. That's what I was practicing all the time. So you were telling me to not be by myself so much. Danny said, grinning from ear to ear. Gosh, well, well done, sweetie. So can we go to the show? Can we? Of course we can go. It's your prize, my love. It felt, I noticed, with a tug on the date of David's anniversary. Danny had passed no comment on this, and I wondered if this was the beginning of David vanishing amongst other figments our son would associate with childhood. If like Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy, David was destined to be shoveled amongst childish things. I get, I get three tickets. Danny's cheerful babble permeated from my sorrow. Can Joe come too? I brushed my aching eyes and smiled at my son. Let's ask him, I said. I phoned Joe and told him to save the day. I heard a smile through the speaker. When the day arrived, Danny sat strapped to the back seat of the car, clutching his wand, sunny with pride that adults are having a night out because of him. He insisted on carrying a picture of David in his pocket, and gratitude filled me seeing the significance of the day wasn't passing him by just yet. Daddy loved magic. He liked to be to be he liked to be coming. He chattered as we drove to pick up Joe. Yes. I'm glad we're doing something today that Daddy loves so much. And it should do it like it. I laughed. Well, Joe doesn't like magic the way we do, does he? Maybe this is the show that'll change his mind, Danny boy. I turned onto Joe's road and tooted the horn outside his flat. Joe emerged and hurried towards the car, beaming. Hello, you two. He slid in the front seat and leaned across to kiss my cheek. Danny's excited we're all going out, I said. Aren't you, Danny? Yeah, Danny said. Thanks for asking me, kiddo. Any new tricks up your sleeve? Said Joe. I'm working on one at the moment. Maybe you can show it to me later. Danny chuckled like a toddler in the back seat. I'd love to, he said, my son, the show-off. We reached the theater, parked, and joined the, the throng walking to the Coliseum. Inside the foyer bustled with parents and company children, dressed in 
and capes. Joe brought. Uh, wait, what? Joe brought a glass of wine and a bucket of popcorn for Danny, and we made our way to the hazy auditorium to find our seats. Danny perched between us, the popcorn bucket balanced on his knees, waving the salon like all the other little conjurers. Joe looked over my son's head at me and smiled, and I loved him for a moment. Just a moment. Then the lights went down. A low hum vibrated from the speakers. Children giggled. Time tickled. Uh, time ticked. When, then, with a burst of confetti and a flutter of flashes, Mike materialized mid-stage. White glove hands raised in greeting as Danny and the other children erupted into hysterics at the sight of the of their hero swathed in silver cape and purple star splash suit. Good evening, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the greatest show on earth. Magic struck up from the pit of the black. I saw pianos and brass, and Mike flowed across the stage, gloved hands up where we could see them demanding our gaze. The communal enchantment being woven over a crowd drew me in. Mike swept about to the music, making crystal balls levitate, pulling a washer behind the ear of a little girl in the front row and tossing silver wands out into the audience. Joe lifted Danny, whose face was on fire with joy, to help him snatch a wand from the air. Another boy was lifted on stage, where Mike had him wave his new silver wand over a top hat and a white rabbit Mike, and lowered into the hat popped out again, no longer white but brown. Ta-da! Mike the Conjurer flourished the hat and presented its empty black innards to the audience. I gaped at Joe as we joined the audience in rapturous applause. Bag under the table, Joe mouth. David never had s such cynicism. Music shifted through various classical pieces. Mike's choreography won oohs and ahs from the crowd. I watched through rising tears. How many hours had our magic tree, magic three, spent watching Mike perform? Snuggled together on a sofa. David, why aren't you here? Finally, the conjurer thrust his cape behind his, his shoulders and faced the audience center stage, mopping his brow with a star-speckled handkerchief. And for my next trick, Mike scanned the auditorium, swearing his Lawn in circles. I need something. I need someone special. Danny leapt onto his seat, both hands in the air, as the other children followed suit. While Ma Mike stalked the stage behind the footlights. Me. Me, 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 me. Pick me, pick me. Joe and I leaned away from Danny as he screeched. Still, the wand swirled. Danny wrenched Joe's hand into the air and waved them both, mania in his face as, with a swoop and a flourish, Mike's wand jerked to a halt. Joe's eyes rounded in surprise as the spotlights lit up, he and my boy in its silver beam. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have our next volunteers. Give them both a hand. Danny pulled Joe to his feet and dragged him towards the stage as the white noise of applause rose around us. Joe looked back at me, grimacing. Thrilled it was him and not me. I motioned him on with a genuine enthusiasm. They were led on stage, Danny bouncing on his toes and waving in the direction of where I sat and looked looking breathtakingly, devastatingly like David. A long black box on wheels with loose hanging straps was rolled out from behind a red curtain. My three beaming women, each with a sheathed sword strapped to, to her back. 
Danny jumped up and down. Joe clutched his head with both hands. Mike went down on one knee beside Danny. What's your name, young magician? Daniel, and this is my mom's boyfriend, Joe. Wonderful to meet you, Daniel. Hi, mom's boyfriend, Joe. Daniel, do you think Joe will be up to helping us with a little trick? Danny, sh Danny shrieked eagerly and sent, causing a cheer of agreement to rise up from the children around me as, as the woman rolled the box to a halt beside them. Several glances caught mine as the adults looked from each other to their excited offspring. We shook our heads in mutual amusement. Kids, eh? That dancer's gray smiked open both ends of the box so the audience could see down its length and invited Joe to do the same. Grouch down, sir, grouch down, and tell us what you see. Is it empty? Is it an empty box, Joe? Mike asked. Joe hunkered down and peeped through the box, then straightened and raised a thumbs up to the audience. We applauded. The sparkle-coated woman strutted around him, reaching out to straighten his clothes, and dust glittered from his hand, from his hair, while Mike took Danny off to the side to whisper in his ear. Joe hugged himself, shielding his eyes against the lights. When Mike and Danny turned back to the, to the applause, three women each took hold of Joe and led him around to the rear of the box while Danny stood like his father. Oh my god, hip cocked and one hand in one pocket, Mike gestured to Joe with his wand. Our volunteer approacheth the magic box, ladies and boys. All around me, children had leapt onto their seats to get a better view in the midst of the ruckus. I understood why the theater was named the Coliseum. Joe gripped the sides of the box and heaved himself inside and lay flat. I watched him shut the lid and secure the buckles tight before spinning the box around on the spot so we can see for ourselves that every belt was buckled and Joe was secured, his head and feet poking out either end. Mike perched Danny on top of the box as the woman took up position along one side of it, the hilts of the swords glinting under the stage lights. Mike raised his hand and silent fell. Is the box locked, Daniel? Mike asked. Danny tugged each belt. Yes. Can Joe get out, Daniel? No. Mom's boyfriend Joe is trapped, ladies and gentlemen. Any audience member looking at me might have thought they were tears of pride running down my face as I watched my son. Everyone thinks their children are beautiful, but Danny, with his teeth perfect as baby pearls, his ecstasy, and I've never seen him this ecstatic so plainly on display. Danny was captivating, and David was missing it. David would always miss it. I would never turn to him to share the joy of looking at the person we created who surprised us every day. We would never notice together how Danny's mannerisms echoed our own. Every direction I looked, children were sandwiched between two parents whose fingers were thoughtlessly entangled. Danny would always have an empty seat on one side of him at every big event, every birthday, at his graduation. It wasn't da David who was with him now on stage. Could Joe, Joe ever truly share what I felt watching Danny grow? This child who every day reminded me of the greatest loss I've yet faced. I married David for life and still had the heart I promised to love him with beating within me. Who was I supposed to give this love to if not him? The hush ascending on the crowd pulled me back to the auditorium. Mike had called for quiet. There was a flourish of drum rolls. One of the women's sashayed to Danny's side, eased her sword. 
from its sheath and presented its sparkling tip to the audience. The drum roll grew in volume and grew in speed until, the, until with a clash of cymbals, the woman thrust the sword through the side of the box, tearing a gasp from the audience. I winced at the sight of Joe's face scrunching. Mike froze with an attitude of horror while a spare woman clapped our hands to two of their mouths and pantomimes of shock. The popcorn scented silence, whispering of waiting children teetering on their seats. Joe's eyes sprang open, he, and he went, waggled his head back and forth. A screech went up from the children. The adults grinned. It took me a moment to realize the children weren't grinning. The screeches had not been appreciated of the jest. The children bathed the stage with like tiny wolves to brave the blood. Again, they shrieked. A tremor passed through me at the little milk fangs they bared as they lashed her arms and pointed fingers at the stage, yelling, Mike waltz around, riling them up. Is that again I hear you cry? Yes! Gloved hand cupped to one ear. You want more? Yes! Why then, drum roll? Drums roll beneath Danny's knees. Joe played dead. A second woman walked to the front of the box, unsheathed her sword, and showed the tip of it, of it to Danny, who tapped it before nodding to the crowd and sucking his finger. Oh, sharp. The crowd cheered. The drum roll intensified. Then the second woman thrust the second sword into the box through Joe's thighs to a crash of cymbals and a thud like Mike dropping dramatically to his knees. The same expectant pause, then the same jeer from Joe as he came alive, again waggling his feet and sticking his tongue out at the children. I was touched by, by his getting into the spirit of the night, so wholeheartedly through the kid's bloodthirst had me spooked. The third woman shredded forward sword unsheathed straight as the horizon. She held it above her head, hilt against one palm and tip against the other. And rescinded the sword to my son. I sat up when Danny took it. The woman lifted him and stood him on a small table near Joe's head. Joe smiled at Danny. Hey, kiddo. Somewhere a, a drum rolled. Danny held the sword tip pointed towards Joe's chest within the box. The, the goads and she. The codes and cheers of the children and the audience blistered into roars around me as as I looked at Danny, looked at Mike, and paused until realization when Mike made a, a sign. But Danny did not thrust the sword into the box on cue as expected. Danny clenched the sword in both hands and raised his arm above his head and plunged the weapon into Joe's exposed throat. Perhaps for some audience members, Joe's reaction was immediate. For me, it hung for a moment, a drop of blood easing from a prickled finger. I waited for a clash of cymbals. The trumpet, ta-da, waited for Joe to laugh and stick his tongue out for Danny as he'd done before. Joe didn't. He started gurgling. I saw my little son lean his weight against the sword's hilt, and Joe's jaws stretched wide as he let loose a sound I've never heard before. One on stage huddled together as Mike's animated hands fell to his sides. They stared at Dandy, Danny standing over Joe. Danny's lips were moving. A bubbling sound echoed Joe's screams. Parents stared at each other, unsure of whether to believe their eyes. I tried to think straight, but my thoughts veered off track in directions I didn't send them. I wanted to run to stage, but when I tried to move, my muscles kicked into gear. I felt unbodied. Something was happening. My son was speaking words that sounded like, I'm telling you, Mama Bear, this kid's magical. An incantation. Daniel was conjuring. Joe screaming intensified in pitch. Daniel pulled his sword in with difficulty until he yanked it free, splattering his sneeze with red. As the release, terrified parents sprang into action, bearing their children from the auditorium screaming. Some children remained, those whose parents were frozen in shock. Has someone called the police, an ambulance? 
Someone had to call the police. Joe screams, frothled into silence. Daniel hopped off the table and picked up his wand. Blood spired, gleaming on his face. He spread his arms wide, cloak fanning out in a sh shimmer of silver, and bowed to Mike and a woman who backed away from him as one. Daniel returned to my feet, and I s slid in into the aisles, waiting for Danny and not wanting him. Someone had to call an ambulance. Joe fell to my knees as Danny jumped off the stage and strolled down to the aisle towards me. Dan! I made no attempt to touch him. What have you done? My new trick, he said. Impressive for you, Mama. I looked behind him to see where Mike stood, white face, staring at my child. The woman had disappeared. Joe's blood pulled around Mike's feet and seeped under the glass of the footlights, filling the auditorium in a blaze of gore. That's not the end yet. Dan said. For the next part, we need to go home. Daniel chattered in a seat beside me in the car as though nothing out of the ordinary had happened. It might have been paint on his face, and I picked him up from Craft Club. The car reeked of blood. Can we go faster? Danny asked. I want you to see the surprise. The wave of the darkness closed in as though the night were something. We were driving into rather than the Peru. Bring us out of the blue with no particular effort after almost 10 years of struggle. Some people had called Daniel's conception a miracle, some fate, others divine intervention. Had it been something else? I'm telling you, Mom. I'm telling you, Mama Bear. This kid's special. It's kid's magical. Had my magic-loving husband pulled a trick from up his sleeve? Us boys are taking a walk, Mama Bear. What had my son and my husband talked about between themselves that day? What surprise, Danny? I asked. What person did you mean? If I tell you, tell, then it won't be a surprise. Tell me, or I'll stop the car and we won't go anywhere until you answer me. Danny sighed. It had to be an exchange. The book said if you want something, you have to give something in exchange to keep it fair. Like swaps. Exchange? Yeah, an exchange. What did you want to exchange, Danny? Are we nearing home? We were. All the downstairs lights were on and I turned the car into the road and approached our house. I hadn't left any lights on. Seeing the house aglow, Danny flung his seatbelt off and gripped the door handle, yelling, It worked! It worked! It worked! He was out of the car, racing towards the front door before I pulled the handbrake. My son did not read occult literature. My son read books on magic tricks. He made coins vanish and always knew what card you pick. My son, like my husband, loved conjuring books, loved magic. One of the oldest forms of entertainment. Through the windscreen, I saw my front door open, spilling an oblong of orange light out onto the path. I tried to look, but couldn't raise my eyes above my son, who stopped in his tracks as a shadow loomed in the sunset, shaded light from, from the hall. A smile broke Danny's red-stained face in two. He ran up the garden path Endless love shining in his eyes and looked at the figure standing in the back, standing in the doorway. Daddy, you're back. And that's it. Oh, wait. Oh, Jerry, what did you say? Yes. Oh. Oh. I'm not sure what else to say. So if your parents die, just murder someone else to bring them back. I think it specifically had to be a boyfriend. <laughs> Booker oh, says Law called it. Equal exchange. Apparently Booker called it coming. Yep. Though, it can't just be anyone. Yeah.
Oh, that was the last story of tonight. I still have a bunch of stories that I want to read eventually. I probably would have gotten through all of them if that one wasn't as long as it was. Jeez, that was long. Alright. Book on last. Oh, wait, hold on. Wrong scene. Book on. Oh, wait. Book on last words. Go. I'm thinking Wednesday of next week, we do horror story stream, just horror stories. Now we await the bookworm. Did you see their comment? Oh, now I see it. It says, uh, like, comment, subscribe, and follow Bright for more horror stories, or else we might sacrifice you to, for a viewer who will. Giving Bright money will protect you even more. Uh, during our last words, go. <laughs> Um, follow, subscribe, right as a bird. God damn it. Uh, Jiri, last words, go. At some point, I will try to craft a bathroom song for Bright. Oh, what the fuck? As it was voted upon. Why? Thanks, food. Food is in a different room right now, so thank them later, I guess. The hell is wrong with you guys? See, Bookworm was one of the people that agreed with food. Was Derna also in agreement? Derna sounded to be on. I just kind of shrugged. So it was two, two people voting for it. Food and. Bookworm. Anyways, 
Thank you, Trinibles. I hope you enjoy these stories and uh, me being really bad at Apex. <laughs> and hope to see you guys next time for your next exper uh, for your next mission.